catch up. <laughs> I know, me too. We're all playing catch up. Oh gosh, please don't do that. How's it going, Og? I am going to go get a refill on my coffee. I have about five minutes. But I think we are about there, about ready to go. How's it going, Jan? So much in my life. Nice. Um, I went ahead and pinned uh, RWXGG as a hashtag, as an alternative to 100 Days of Code. Um, had a little run-in with the 100 Days of Code guy. Uh, I deleted most of the tweets, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, he he wrote a blog post which was published to the entire universe uh, because of Free Code Camp that basically has seven tips for how to be completely and totally dependent on Vim and never be able to use it on anything but your localized computer, which is the exact opposite of what I have been advocating for. And so in the Discord, I posted about it, but I actually critiqued him pretty strongly and said, this is exactly the wrong way to do this. And he called me a hater and it exploded into this massive Twitter fight. So I have decided um, uh, to go ahead and make my own hashtag RWXGG and stop using the 100 days of code hashtag, which if you think about it, it's kind of stupid. Uh, yes, this is 112 days of a big air boost, but the, the, the goal here is for you to become an autodidact and to really focus on your learning over time instead of thinking that you're just going to focus for 100 days and you're going to be fine. So um, I'm actually glad, kind of glad it happened because it, it did two things for me. <laughs> it solidified the need for there to be some good information out there. And it also brought forward how important it is um, that we kind of band together as a community and support each other and that we learn to be able to disagree without thinking that we hate each other. And I cannot tell you, thanks for the sub, um, I cannot tell you how much that frustrates me uh, when people call you a hater for disagreeing with them. And, you know, and I, I, I've gone a little bit too far sometimes and, and had fun with people in the, the way that my generation does. But, but, uh, but even so, like Linus Torvalds, I've showed you those videos. And this is all before we get going here. I just wanted to kind of rant a little bit. But I just want to say this. So this is what's going down in case you're wondering, why is Mr. Rob so stressed? Um, that's why. So um, I think that uh, I think we're doing the right thing by, you know, don't get angry, get busy. Don't get angry get busy. If you don't like something that's out there, get busy and make something else. Don't complain about it. And so I'm really glad that, that it brought us to that point. Anyway, so here is the, uh, <laughs> uh, so here we go. RWX.gg uh, has some new changes to it, which I will talk about at 1110. I don't want to miss anybody. I am going to go refresh my coffee. Give me one, two minutes and we'll get there. Uh, but here's today's schedule. You can go ahead and click on it. It should take you to day five. I'll be right back.
Ah, uh, all right. 11.09 and 11.10 exactly. Uh, so let's do this. Um, day five. Day five scares me. I'm just going to tell you. Day five scares me for lots of reasons, but, but mostly because it has got all of networking on it in one day. <laughs> and I just want to say um, uh, that networking is is a huge thing it's a huge huge thing and uh we were <laughs> we were gonna have a networking week um but we talked about this yesterday there is no way we can cover all of networking i mean truly networking like you know get your certificate in networking or even get started to get your certificate in networking in a week there's just no way um and again this is a beginner boost so this is designed to give you the idea enough about where to go. Yeah, Lieutenant Bob and El Ramingo are prepped, and they and um and they are. I hope that they that they put out their material soon because we really need some. Um, in fact, let's start right. Let's go ahead and right away and start with that. Uh, but before we do, DNS don't smoke. Um, let, I just want to show you a few changes I made here to the to the um, thing overnight. Uh, so. You can now click on the video links uh, in the schedule and it will take you to the videos. Of course, this one I just posted, so it's not ready yet. Uh, so in the day one titles, there is a, now a link. This is new. So I added this last night. Uh, this will take you to the video. It doesn't give you any like breakdown, so you can't like click to a, an exact point in the video, uh, which would be a nice addition someday. I also probably need to make my links so they don't take over. Um, uh, so anyway, that is there. Um, uh, what else did I do? I uh, do, 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 do. I organized the content a little bit better. Uh, I added um, sort of a checkbox list of learning project ideas to every day. So please go check those out. Um, if you have some suggestions, we can add them. You cannot yet click on them to remember your progress. I am plan on making it so you can click on these. And on the same computer, uh, it will it will just mark it. It's not going to save it to a database or anything like that. I don't need to, to do all of that. This is just so like, for example, if you have this app on your phone uh, and you just want to keep track of your checklist, you could go on your phone and just tap it and you can like check off the ones you've done. Um, just as it's just a really silly way to do it. You should be probably keeping your own notes anyway. So, you know, this is just one extra thing to kind of help you. But but I did realize that people like to ask for ideas. Uh, about what they should be doing every day and so that's just a, just a, a completely fast way to do it. Uh, I, people have asked about whether we should add everybody's Jamstack sites uh, to RWXGG. Uh, I would very much like to do that. Um, uh, I do not... Uh, we, Jamstack is something we're not going to talk about today. We did talk about that Jamstack on the first day and you can go back and look at that site or you can go to Jamstack, uh, I think it's .io or is it .org? jamstack.org if you can learn all about that we are going to do lots of jamstack stuff on the web days which are coming up um, another reason too uh, I, I realized I actually went through the book again the Linux book uh, recently and I realized a lot of the stuff that we've been covering this week is covered in the book and I've been feeling uh, a little bit taxed because we've been scra you know, scrambling through what are supposed to be just these kind of samples of stuff and and we're really going to go into them in detail uh, in in weeks three and four, uh, and then of course the web stuff starting in week six currently, uh, and that will be um, stuff like what is the Jamstack and all of that. And I, I I'm very much looking forward to those weeks because I plan to fully annotate the book, uh, which is basically my take on what's in the book, what they left out, what I think they may have gotten a little bit wrong, um, and and that's that's all coming, and that's what I do uh, every second of my day. <laughs> what I'm, what, pretty much, no, I'm relaxed when I'm when I'm not on stream with you guys. So I, a little bit enough of an overview book overview. Uh, all the books are Libra except uh, for. Uh, by the way, if you want to know what those books are. Uh, rwx.gg slash books. Uh, this is all the books we use in the course. Uh, there are two that are not free. Uh, I will say they can be found for free on the internet. Um, I'm actually missing Head First Go. That's not here either. I need to add that. So, but these the, the first one is free, and um, the the and I am looking for uh, alternatives that are free. 
uh, to these books. But a lot of times when you want good content, you still have to pay. Um, so, so that's the thing. We did talk about that on the first day, but we're going to be just kind of a ramp up so that you don't have to worry about next week. So, um, because next week we're going to be talking about uh, installing and running Linux all week. We're going to be talking about Linux and Linux history. Um, uh, we'll talk about Linux certification briefly. Uh, all of that. Um, so next week is really, really, really deep dive, not deep diving, but as deep as we're going to into the Linux, what it is, how to get it, how to install it, uh, where you might want to go with it as a career, blah, blah, blah. And then after that's uh, command line stuff. I realized that I'm actually jumping ahead and covering something I'm going to do at the end of the day today again, which is basically just to wrap up and and I'll, I'll come back to that. We have um, a lot to do today. All right. So, uh, and I'm just going to tell you right now, there is no way I can cover everything in networking. And that's why I'm kind of like uh, worried about today. So the best I can do, and, and, and I, I had to kind of ground myself and say, um, uh, I'm going to come back to, um, yeah, the, the best part thing that I can do is I can do for you what I do for the people in my private mentoring sessions. And that is to summarize how uh, your home network works and how your internet works uh, in 40 minutes. Uh, and frankly, when you're just starting out, you don't need much more than that. You just need to know that there's other stuff to go out and look at. And you certainly don't need to read this book. I know it's backwards, but has anybody ever seen this book before? Right? TCPI Bill Illustrated. You know what my favorite part of this whole book was? The first page right here. All right. This is actually volume one. There's volume two. Uh, and that's how in the 90s, this is how you learned about TCP IP, which is the networking protocol of the Internet uh, developed at... Um, in Palo Alto at Xerox um, uh, with Ethernet, along with Ethernet, which is what is the wires that connect everything. Uh, don't 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 look at this book. We're gonna I'm gonna show you another book about networking. So before we get going any farther, if you want to deep dive into books, um, I have the the book that I learned from was uh, TCP/IP Illustrated, and by just ripping apart packets and watching them by writing a packet sniffer. Uh, and during the week of networking, we were actually going to set up a Minecraft server and we were going to, I'm going to put that as something that I suggest that you do. It's a lot of fun to do that. Um, but I don't, I don't want to try to cram that in even to a week. Uh, but I'll describe the stuff that you would do to do that. And, um, so let's go back here to the books. So, uh, of all the books that I've looked at, uh, the, the, the one that, um, that I am the most encouraged to recommend to beginners uh, is Head First Networking. And there's probably going to be lots of recommendations uh, in the chat and in Discord for what good books to read, uh, particularly from people who do networking every day, all day, uh, like uh, LTN Rob, uh, Bob, uh, who, you know, that's what he does. He teaches it. Uh, Ramingo, who's a network engineer, and other people in our community who spend most of their days involved with networking. Uh, my involvement with networking has largely been getting things to work and breaking into networks and making sure my network can't be broken into. Um, so, uh, so that's that's it. Uh, this book is way too much. I thought I considered it for today for a little bit. Uh, so I'm just going to describe this resource for about two or three minutes. And then um, tell you what I like about it, what I haven't really read. Um, I haven't read the whole thing word for word, so I just scanned through it pretty well. Um, and then also, uh, we'll, after that, we'll, I'll just do my little spiel for how you can best get your head around what a network is um, in the simplest way possible. By telling stories. <laughs> so this is again this is another one of those head first O'Reilly books which has lots of pretty pictures and they do it on purpose because it's easier to remember they make it as silly as possible because your brain remembers silly things that's how people compete in memory competitions is by associating difficult uh, numbers and characters with with stories and so that's how your brain works that's what's behind the head first series just in case you're wondering again and and it goes through uh the whole thing it says, um, listen to your network troubles, working out with wires. Uh, okay, so this is the one thing I, I'm not going to talk about today, but you should definitely understand. Um, so the, the, 
It says here, the top 10 things we didn't cover. Networking is a huge subject. Even this book doesn't cover the whole subject. Um, application layer, transport layer, internet layer, and link layer. Uh, so I'll just tell you what those are really quick. The link layer is how the things are connected, the hardware, uh, how you know how the wires are getting plugged in, how the satellites work, how the Wi-Fi uh, works. Uh, the internet layer is the um, the packets. Everything gets made into basically a little a little um, mail packet package if you want to call it and it gets sent around every time your your router blinks it's another one of these little packages traveling around we'll talk about that more in a bit uh and transport is is what kind of of um so lay, the I, the lay, internet layer is just that the the time the tiny the, like the, the stuff on the wire and then the transport is is like tcp ip and the application layer is stuff like http which is like now we're talking about web web you know servers asking questions so so understanding how these layers build up on each other is really important um is it required for you to become a programmer uh or to even become a hacker or a pen tester no you don't need to know it you need to know the application layer you need to know http in particular and you need to know tcp ip and how it works what's the difference between tcp and and udp and icmp uh those are all um internet protocols uh and they're kind of on the transport layer um so 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 there you go uh but i'm just kind of wanted that too much more but so if you go through this book though you can see that it does have uh you know pieces of hardware that are involved this actually has you suggest that you go get um a tracer which i think is really interesting i don't own one i've never used one i always just connect things and test them that way uh i'm not a network engineer by any means network engineers by the way are are really smart people and they've done a lot of work to understand networking and if you're a system administrator the network engineer is just culturally uh they kind of like hold themselves above everybody else because because they are like you know they're like the keepers of the network and you're just a lowly system administrator that use their network it's kind of funny because there's the same sort of cultural relationship between let's say an application developer and a systems administrator in the old days um you know because the applications developer may i please put my application on your computer and you're like i don't know is it good enough how well does it deal with ram it's, you know it's kind of the bofh and so then you know you, this has all been resolved largely by devops but it's still kind of fun to reminisce and and then you have and then the you know the food chain is that um you know the system administrators that have to go to the network guys and say can i please put this computer on the network <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Did you configure it properly? What's it's you know, are you using single duplex or you know full duplex? Because those AIX boxes, you know, they 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 default back to to, to single duplex and they're really slow on that. Blah, blah. So the network guys will like talk, you know, they, you know, the system is like, please put my computer on the network, <laughs> and then it it's it's and then at one point there was operators who actually are in a long time ago there were operators who actually did this this stuff with the computers, and nobody did anything without. That them touching and doing this stuff on they were the only ones allowed to even touch the computers so it's just a fun little cultural thing that's been around the, the culture in the industry has changed a lot but it's it's great to to know that so if you are a network engineer you know uh or if you know about network things maybe they will you know respect you more so this is you know that's what you would see in a computer room uh <laughs> so here you go here's some cat5 uh i suggest everybody go ahead and make a cat5 cable at some point in your or it might be 60 at this point uh, these are the cables that you make that connect everything together um and you don't probably use the cable anymore in the old days we use cables all the time uh as uh, wiring up your house is called low voltage wiring that's all the sound wiring and all the hardware for your house and it's actually still kind of fun to do this um there is nothing more secure than a wired network so your wi-fi is pretty easy to hack uh, and this is not so just that's something to consider as you're learning about this this is twist and pair learning how to do these things and not cutting your fingers on them um so i'm going to jump ahead uh just to, i'm just summarizing the book for you so these are the cables that plug um your computers and your router into everything you may have seen them uh, by the way, uh, one of the biggest technical innovations that allowed uh, these packets to travel over very, very long distances uh, was the twisted pair of the cable. It's a, it's a cool little electronics thing that Frank or somebody in the community can tell us a lot more about this. But this is a pretty interesting little little physics 
bit of knowledge, and I truly don't understand it other than that something about the twisting of the cables um, caused the um, impedance or the the stuff that would mess up the cable uh, and you know the the, it, the the signal to degrade to be less. So the actual twisting of the cables was a major big breakthrough. Uh, so, so twisting cancels magnetic fields of each wire. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Uh, the coil order back in the day, me too. So I just, I just think that's a cool little, you know, kind of fun fact uh, about how uh, the internet was allowed to happen, um, because until they invented twisted pair, uh, it was all coax and other other ways of, of doing things that were much more big and bulky. And so the twisting of the cables was a, was a, quite a discovery. And, and um, let's see, ele ele electromagnetic inter interference emi nice guys uh but might be approximate all right yep but well you guys know much more than i do on that and if you're beginning and you don't understand it just just though it's kind of cool that the, the twisting made the internet happen <laughs> so here's how you make the cables uh we're gonna zoom ahead here um the twisting on all four pairs is different not to interfere with each other oh interest yeah four pairs that's yeah, okay, so, and, um, so let's keep going here. This is coax, you've probably seen coax cable, that's the kind of connects your, used to be how you connected your, um, your network, there were different types of networks back in the day, there was one called token ring that failed, thank God, it was invented by IBM, and, uh, it was a bad network topology, where if one piece of the network didn't work, the whole network was out, uh, and, and this is why Ethernet won, thank God, um, uh, and then as we keep going, Ethernet is, by the way, the name of the sort of hardware layer uh, that allows the whole internet to happen. And let's keep going back. I was, um, let's see, let's keep going with the cables. Here's the coax, how things are terminated. Lots of interesting stuff here. I personally want to go work through this book myself because it does answer a lot of the little questions I've had uh, about fiber and about, you know, um, like fixing things. Um, I have a feeling even if you went through this book, you'd be pretty close to getting one of your uh, network certifications. Uh, it's a pretty big book. It's 500 or so pages, so I have to go through it pretty quickly. Uh, it tells you some things that are, are likely to cause problems with your network. I mean, this is just, it's just a fun little book to have. Even if, if I mean, I, if, if you're in the position to buy it and, and you know, I, this was actually downloaded. Um, you know, having purchased the book, I, I don't feel bad downloading the PDFs. Uh, but this is here. You can see like just and it's just lots of little things about how networks work. So you know, if the autodidact in you is like you know itching to understand how networks actually work, or if you want to go into networking, you can like learn about all these little things. I think this book is a really fun way to do it. I mean, most of the most of the the, the stuff about networking is pretty dry. Uh, it's not nearly as fun as this is. Um, I've never seen anything quite this fun, so it's actually got me interested. I, this is the first, I've always wanted to get, is this what we call an oscilloscope? Yeah, I've always wanted to have an oscilloscope to just to just own one. I just think it would be so much fun. But um, so I don't know, maybe not be your thing, but if it is, you know, this this is where you go to learn about all these fun things. Um, there's a little bit of crossover with my music interest too, because a lot of this. The, the physics and you know the explanation of these things applies to to sound as well uh what we got uh uh no 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 this is head first networking you'd have to buy it in the united states uh or there are pdfs available um but uh i mean it's a it's a fun book oh, here's the good they even talk about hexadecimal and binary which which we we talk about in other times because that's definitely something you, you have to know that because you know binary is what everything is when it goes across the wire uh, you need to know that when you understand like IP addresses, we're going to come back to that in a bit. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, it talks about Matryoshka dolls. This stuff is really important. This right here, this diagram is probably the most important one. Uh, it talks about how all of that data, all those ones and zeros are divided up when they travel over your, over the wire. And uh, they, they have a they talk about Matryoshka dolls, and that's how it it's like having a package inside of another package inside of another package, and that's how network frames work. They're they I'm calling them packets, but they're calling them network frames, which is probably a better term. Um, 
and it shows you how it's broken down. So yeah, I'm super excited to read through this book. I have not read through the whole thing, and I'm not even on like the first quarter of the book. It goes into much, much more detail um, about. You know, here we go. So we're going to talk about you know addresses and stuff. We're going to I'm going to give you kind of an overview about that uh, for the last half an hour here. Uh, I'm going to give you my little um, spiel that I give to my you know, people as young as 10 years old in terms of how to understand how the internet works. Uh, it's a very, very over big oversimplification. Uh, so f- to the people that are in the chat who know <laughs> networking, please, please be patient um, and, you know, give me some slack here. We're talking to you really young people. Um, but but yeah, but I, I just want to, you know, put this book out there for you. If you do want to dig through the, the details, this is a fun way to do it. Uh, if you want, I'm going to put a plug in for your community college. Um, so the community college up the street here where we live, where um, LTN Bob works, uh, has a phenomenal network lab. And networking is one of the things where it's actually pretty expensive for you to play around with it other than your own home network. Um, so... Um, uh, <laughs> so if you if you want to understand uh, networks, I, I I'm gonna put a plug in for your local community college uh, because usually your local community college has an extra class or two that you can take uh, where you can go in there and they have they have entire setups where you can like really mess with the network and and look at things and watch how the how the monitoring is all working and it might actually make it better for you to to deal with your own home network later. Um, you know everybody should should check out their you know log into their own home um, router and make sure they change the password and things like that and that, that's one of the things I've listed in our learning project suggestions but everybody should do that but you know messing around with 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 routing and stuff like that outside of that uh, is, is a little bit harder to do uh, there are some things you can do for example you can get um, we'll talk about it later but you can get um, what's called a, an alpha uh, dongle. I know that sounds weird, but it is in um, it. It allow, It's a Wi-Fi dongle that allows you to see much, much more uh, about the what's going on on your Wi-Fi network and, and other people's Wi-Fi networks uh, than you could normally. So there is some experimentation hardware-wise that you can do uh, when you're not here. We're going to do this ping command today, and um, and 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 this is stuff. I'm I'm doing network kinds of stuff all the time uh, when I'm not doing this. Um, because a lot of it is related to uh, to pen testing and security and stuff. The first step, of course, is is understanding what's out there and how to get into it. And that means you have to understand how networks work and network protocols work. All right. So I think I've talked too much on this. I only have a half an hour to, to go through and, and give my little spiel and then uh, to show you some of the tools you can use. Uh, again, this is just meant to kind of give you some some ideas to go think to go look things to go look at snmp there we go it's like one of the application protocols what do we got we have dhcp we're going to talk about that dynamic host control protocol that's how you get your names uh, and your ip assigned not names that's dns um and we're going to talk about some more things uh just trace route Anyway, we have oh firewalls. How to how to keep your internet safe? All your routers are all using. All of you uh, have routers that are keeping you safe in your house. Hopefully, maybe they're not. Maybe they aren't. It's another reason I can't show you a lot of these tools is because I don't want to dox my whole home network. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I could do that without it. And we also need to talk about VPN. Where there's no way we're going to be able to get into that. But that's we're going to talk about that in a different segment today. Uh, the ASCII tables. There we go. The ASCII tables are in here. I mean, this is a good book. It's got a lot of, a lot of references. So there we go. Four hundred pages or so. All right. Lots of stuff to know. Uh, but give it a shot. Give it a shot if you wanna. If you wanna go through that. All right. So, so the um, the easy way. Um, uh, go and see what they want to recommend. Now, this is a. I, I didn't list this one on there. I'm gonna go add. By the way, I'm gonna add uh, the. The head first um, network. I was I was not sure of it until yesterday about whether I wanted to recommend it to people. But having like scanned through it, I think it's an actually a really great beginning resource for uh, for networking. Uh, but it's definitely not required for for the boost. Um, uh, the only thing you really know about from the boost on networking is you need to understand basically as we as we as I mentioned earlier how how does the internet work and how does your home network work. So. Um, uh, telling it on the screen with no background. 
Um, so what we're going to talk about here is uh, what to do. What is how does the internet work? Okay, so uh, the best way for me to to help you understand the internet is to think of it in terms of uh, a postal system, a really, really, really fast postal system. Uh, and I know our, our actual postal system is in trouble here in the United States, but but it's a good way to think of it. And there's many, many ways that it's that it's a bad metaphor. And if you know, you know, but it's but if you're a beginner, it helps you get your head around. So pretend like I'm talking to someone who's 10 years old, 10, 11 or 12. All right. So how does the Internet work? Well, um, basically, all of our houses are the equivalent of of um, computers on the Internet or devices, phones, anything that's on the internet. Our, our, we can compare them kind of to our homes and our buildings uh, in, in our real world. And the mail that we send between, if we were using postal mail, we don't use that very much anymore, but if we were sending uh, postal mail and packages around to different things, uh, that's that's the system. So so when I, when I need to send uh, information to somebody else, uh, I write down the address on the envelope or on the package, and I say, here's where it goes. Uh, but I don't take it to that place. What I do is I take it to the postman or put it in my, I don't even take it there. I put it maybe sometimes just in my mailbox. You know, we actually have a post office box. So I would, you know, a lot of times I would take it to the post office. But we don't care. We don't care about where it goes after that, right? I don't care. I just put an address on it. I don't, I, as long as it gets there, I don't care. And as long as it makes it in one piece and doesn't get stolen and doesn't get broken and doesn't get dropped. So in many ways, there are direct correlations to how the actual internet works. And if you've ever had drop packets or lag or anything like that, then you know how, you know, when the system's not working. So then the package goes to the post office and the post office, uh, the first post office, that's kind of like your router. So everybody has to, to connect to the internet. You all have a router. Now, some of you have a router that doubles as a firewall that protects you. Most of you do probably. Uh, but you actually usually have two pieces. Some people have one, some people have two. But you have you have the the Wi-Fi. If you're on Wi-Fi, you have the Wi-Fi router that receives uh, the first you know package, and then and then it immediately hands it off to uh, your cable modem, uh, which is kind of like another post office that's in the same building. And then it's like, okay, you get this now, but and you you get all the packages. But I I just processed the packages for you now. I'm going to give you the package, and then that gets the package. Um, uh, it's it's not a firewall, okay? It's it is it well it that is a router, but there is definitely a firewall built into most Wi-Fi routers. I mean, in terms of the, so when I say firewall, I mean there's something there that protects people from incoming connections to you. And I call that a firewall. If that's not a firewall, help me know what to call it better. <laughs> so uh, it's it's that uh, there are firewall rules in the router, and that's that's what I that's what I'm alluding to. Okay, so basically, let's whatever we call it, the router that's connecting you to the internet is protecting you. All right, let's just say that. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah. So there's. Uh, that's fine. It's fine, guys. These um, Ramingo knows what he's talking about. He's a network guy. Uh, so my point is, we have somebody protecting us. Okay. So, so let's imagine. Imagine that is the first, the first post office, right? And then we have the other post office that's in the same building, and it hands off to that post office. Okay. And that that is equivalent to uh, your Wi-Fi router, you know, that listens to all your 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 Wi-Fi, and then it connects usually by with one cable to to the um to the cable modem. And then that connects to the internet. But when you after that, you don't even know where it goes, right? Uh, and what it actually does is it it connects to so all the mail from uh, all let's let's say all the mail from this post office is all destined for one central post office. And I used to work in the bank, and that's exactly what we did. I worked in the post office for a bank, the, the mail room, and we took every we sorted out all the all the envelopes and everything. And we would take all of those in a truck and we would go to the post office and drop it all off at the central post office. And that is the same as if you, you were to think about your cable modem connecting to its first connection, uh, which is your service provider, your internet service provider. And and they have uh, a router that receives that information as well. And so on and so on and so on. They have a sorting, they have you know ways of sorting it at that main place. Uh, then they have ways of sorting it at the next place, and then they have ways of sorting it at the next place. And every step along the way, 
uh, the, the, let's say, person receiving the package looks at the address on the package and they sort it and they say, okay, this goes over here. Sometimes they'll even write on it. Okay, and that's actually very similar to how I have packets work. That sometimes they'll put it in another package, you know, essentially, like they'll put it in a group. Uh, we had slots in the bank for all the different things and we to organize it all. And so all of this mail travels all over the place without you really knowing how it gets there. And there's a really important comparison here. Um, if one of the post offices gets taken out, Unless it's your post office, your actual first top post office, the, the, the mail should still make it. And the reason for that is because the people that are sending your mail are going to find another way to get your mail to where it needs to go. Okay. And um, so, so that, that is largely what's happening on the internet. That's what's happening with all of your data. Uh, anytime you do anything uh, on the internet, uh, what you are doing gets basically converted into packages they're not they're not even truly packets people use the word term packet all the time packet frame i guess those terms are sort of interchangeable um but my point is is that there you can think of you know at light speed all of these packages are being sent out and they're going all over the internet and they're getting to where they need to go because everything is looking at the address and go oh you need to go here okay uh, oh you need to go here uh, oh you need to go here right and that's how that's how stuff is being passed along. And so, um, and anytime you see a blink in the light on your router, you can kind of think of it as if mail's being sent, right? And it's not email. It's, it's you know, this, this, this metaphor that I just talked about. So, so knowing that, now we can take our comparison and we can uh, put some other pieces in the puzzle here. So, for example, um, uh, an old cartoon. Very nice. Um, uh, so based on that, so we, there are things called, uh, IP numbers and I wish I had, I, I looked for a diagram of this, but, uh, I don't have one. So, um, IP numbers, let's just type an IP number, for example. So, um, when you say that let's, let's actually take an actual email, right? So let's say you're going to send email to me at my uh, domain and you the you need a way to look up how to send it so the address that you're putting on the package is uh, rwx at robs.io well robs.io is just for the humans it's called a domain name okay so all the websites and everything out there they're all code domain names and if you want to get your own domain name uh, you go to namecheap.com and you go look. I have nothing to do with them, but go search for your domain and see if you see if you like what your domain is. Okay, so this is how you get a website name. This is how you get an email address. Uh, anytime that you're using a name, uh, you're using what's called a domain name, and the domain names are an extra piece of all of this that are helping us be human and not have to just use numbers. And so this is a really important thing you understand about domain names. Every single domain name resolves to one or more IP numbers. And the IP number, the IP stands for Internet Protocol. And the IP number is, the IP address, IP number, is the number, which translates into a bunch of ones and zeros, that the you know computerized post office is using to decide where your thing goes next so for example you can look up i'm going to use dig here uh so robs.io is my domain and um so we see here that um so so dig space uh robs.io shows that i have an a record that's a type of address in the domain name system the domain name system is a system um uh, that lets you um uh, you know, look up these numbers. Okay. And it happens really fast. It's a really amazing system, uh, by itself just to study that. Um, and that's what tells us to say, okay, so anytime that I want to send a packet to robs.io, I'm actually sending it to this IP number and let me show you. So let's actually try to send some packets. We use the ping program. Ping just sends a packet using a protocol called ICMP, which is 
is just a protocol designed for for watching the network and monitoring and seeing if it works. And sometimes it's blocked, uh, but but it, it's not TCP IP. TCP IP is the really important protocol uh, that just controls most of your communication. Uh, there's one other important one called UDP, which most of you use for your games. And the only difference between TCP and UDP, I know I'm in the weeds here, is that UDP doesn't care about getting an acknowledgement of having been sent. Uh, and you can compare that to mail when you have re re return receipt. Uh, you know how you, like, when you send an email, I mean, you send a package and you say, I want return receipt. And then, in other words, the post office notifies you when it got the package, right? It's a lot slower to do that. Well, that's kind of equivalent to TCP IP. Uh, transposition control protocol and it what it does is it wraps up the ip packet and says okay i want i want you to tell me when you got it it's called a, a fin waiter acknowledgement uh and then it comes back and and that can be a problem because what if somebody decides to not answer you well you're seeing how long do you wait so because of that the tcp ip protocol is not used where really intense um uh really intense like communication is required uh, and you really don't care about uh, the answer because there's going to be a new packet before you would even get done asking the question about whether there's you know another packet so and that that is um, streaming is a great example of UDP so it's just like here's a ton of packets hey if you missed one just draw the next one right we're good uh, any kind of uh, real-time gaming or streaming uses UDP so and um, and that's all we're really going to talk about on that. So there's this, it's kind of like having a, a different way to use the same post office, right? With UDP, you're like, hey, here, just, it's like a postcard. If you don't get the postcard, no one's going to die, right? We're fine. And then and then there's the kind of regular, and, and then all the other mail is like, all return request received. It's like, I'm going to send you a package and you're going to tell me you got the package or I'm not going to confirm to I'm not going to stop. I'm going to sit here and wait until you tell me. So that's the different way of looking at it. And then there's this other protocol over here. It's called ICMP. I think it's Internet Control Messaging Protocol, if I remember. And what that is, is it's like, hey, I'm just here. I'm just here checking on the system here. I just want to see who the next router is. I just want to see if you're even out there. And that's called ICMP. So those are really the only... Um, uh, you know transport layer protocols that you really need to understand um and so let's try one so ping i'm going to ping robs.io uh, and this is going to give me a back message now you should add ping to your list of things in your notes you got your notes open right you should add ping to your list of notes right now okay there is no better command i mean there's lots of commands but there is no simpler more ubiquitous command to check whether your connection to the internet is working. So let's say you think your internet's down. You think your internet service provider is, is down or you think your Wi-Fi power went out, right? Well, just ping one of your favorite hosts out there, you know, ping, ping rwx.gg. Maybe try it right now, right? Every single thing out there, uh, you'll get a ping back if it's out there. It also tells you how fast it is. So if you've ever watched competitive gamers, they have a slang term called ping. Yep, that's a fast one. Uh, uh, I don't think, can you ping 1.1? I don't think you can ping 1.1, can you? So anyway, um, but you guys, oh, that's a pretty fast one. Yeah, 888, that's probably your DNS. Uh, a Bob Ross of computing. So, so here we go. So we're pinging, we're doing a happy little ping. Uh, and we're pinging like uh, 30, 34 milliseconds. That's pretty damn fast. Uh, in case you're wondering, these millisecond times, if, has anybody ever turned ping on? Has anybody ever turned network latency on in Overwatch or something like that where you like want to see what your response time is and you can make an adjustment as, as Google and yeah, as Cloudflare? Yeah, you can also just ping Google. But those are the DNS servers for those things. Yeah, and um, yeah, Google DNS. Yeah, I was going to say Google DNS. So these are all designed to be really, really, really fast. Uh, in fact, Google DNS is this, this is a name, this is the address of a computer, that's an over understatement, uh, at Google that gives you back the IP number that goes with a name. So like I just did with robs.io, that gives you back the, the number, okay? And that's why it's so fast. Look at how fast it talks back to you. Super duper fast. This is really fast for a computer on the internet. Uh, if you want to have fun with this, go ahead and ping something in another state or like, was it yandex.ru? Yeah, so this is a, this is a server in Russia. And look what we get here. 
Look at how many, look how the millisecond time on that, right? Um, uh, wow, yeah. Uh, so you can ping rwx.gg, which is a, a Netlify server. Um, and those Netlify servers are in, I believe they're in the States. Um, so uh, 42 is not too bad. It depends on what you're trying to connect to. Um, so this tells you the speed of your connection to that. But here's the more fun one, guys. Um, is the more fun one when it works does not always work is called trace route and there's a good chance you don't have it um i mean there's probably new versions of this i use netlify yep we, we covered that in another video promoter uh so trace uh so let's see here uh was different than mine okay the reason for that is because uh, is because RWXGG is using what's called a content delivery network. And this is why you should use a content delivery network. Uh, what it does is it puts the content closer to you on one of three, four, five, eight hundred servers. And that's what Netlify does. That's why you should be using Netlify. Uh, because your IP for Netlify is going to be different than my IP for Netlify. And it's a very complicated thing. But what it allows is it allows the content of my website to be closer to you. If I had put it on a server in my you know room downstairs, uh, you would have to connect to this one and only this one. So this is called a content delivery network. And that's one of the advantages of, um, of a sort of a Jamstack static approach. Uh, and that's a, a topic in the weeds that we won't talk about now. So just understand uh, content delivery network. Uh, we're doing good on time, but I'm about to take a break here in four minutes. So let's try one other way to try things. And during the break, you can try to look at things, okay? Uh, so for example, let's, instead of just doing ping, let's try one called trace route. Um, and I might not even have trace route installed over here. I think I do. Trace path. Trace path, I think, is the new version of trace route. And so let's see where it has to go to get to rwx.gg. Okay. It's telling me where it's going. It's telling me all the hosts. Uh, you can do say, so guys, trace route is the old thing and trace path is the new thing. Okay. Uh, and everybody's got a different one. So this is a tool that uses the, um, the ISMP protocol, uh, to effectively ping each thing along the way and see what comes next. And as you can see, there's lots of blank holes in here. That's because there's devices that are doing things that are not playing ICMP. They're like, no, I refuse. Because these tools for discovering systems and hosts are used by hackers all the time. Um, so, so, so there you go. Uh, uh, hopped into stream with kind of yeah. So, so as you can see, uh, between my request for rwx.gg, uh, my mail, my you know, packages have to go through like 16 different post office routing things, you know, different routers. And you can see, uh, this is the reason I like trace path is it actually shows you the response times between each segment, which is very, I, I think that's really cool. Because that shows you how I think that's what that is anyway, and this shows you uh, this is trace path. Yeah, I'm using trace path, which apparently comes with Mint. Um, I believe trace path has has superseded trace route, which was an older uh, version of the same tool. So there's two tools uh, for you to remember and put in your notes if you want to kind of diagnose what's going on. Um, so maybe all of a sudden you can't see something. If you're using trace route, you'll get the, you'll get the asterisks a lot. That just means that there's, it can't get any answers. There's no way to identify what's really there. Um, so, uh, yeah, path ping that in, I don't know about that one. There's lots of ways to do this. So the takeaway here, uh, before I go on my little break here is, uh, you have this, this metaphor of the post office system, uh, and, and different kinds of mail stuff that has to have re answers to, pr to prove it made it there. TCP IP, uh, stuff that you would just postcards that we just give as many postcards as possible. Don't really care if that we get answers. And that's like UDP games and streams use that. And then we have ICMP, which tells us what's going on and ping and trace route and trace path use that. Um, in the whole thing, by the way, if you want to look up the IP, uh, you can use dig. Uh, there's other tools for this. Uh, there's, um, the one that we used to use. Oh God, I can't even remember now. And, and see, look up. No, Gosh, I can't remember it now. I've used dig so much. So dig space, and then you put the name 
uh, NSLOOKUP, thank you guys. Uh, NSLOOKUP was the one we used for years. That's the one we used in the 90, 90s. But um, uh, so so here we go. So we uh, DIG is, 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 there's actually an even better one than DIG uh, now, but I don't remember it. So, so uh, NSLOOKUP, uh, DIG, and this other one that I can't remember are ways of looking up um, uh, what's going on. Now, if you want to look up your own address, uh, here's another command to add to your list, and then I'll go for my break. IP dash BR A space A. Okay, don't forget the dash BR. You're going to get flooded with a bunch of stuff that you don't know, like that, right? So you don't need all that right now. We're going to talk about that stuff later. But for right now, if you're on uh, a, a modern Linux system, you can do dash BR stands for brief A. And this will show you... Um, uh, this will show you all of the the um, connections that your computer has to the internet, and we're going to talk about what the little what other ways we're going to talk about ports uh, uh, after the break, and and we'll we'll talk about that. Okay, so for right now we're just talking about IP addresses. So there's my internal IP address. Uh, there is a way for you to look up your IP address on the internet, uh, which uh, I don't want to look at right now. Um, and uh, I'm going to see if I can... Actually, we'll talk about when I come back. Okay. I'm going to take a quick break, AFK, until... So if you guys want to help each other out with all those commands and practice on them, uh, let me know. Uh, you, if you don't have TracePath on there, you can add it. So if you want to add TracePath, you can do sudo apt install uh, TracePath, I'm pretty sure. And I should put it on for you. Okay. I'm not going to do mine, but you can do that. All right. Um, so I am going to be AFK. I'm going to be AFK for 15 minutes. I'll be back at at 12, 15, no, 10. And is it IP utils trace path? Thank you. Uh, but help each other out. And we'll, we'll cover a little bit of NetStat. NetStat's kind of in the weeds for most people, but we will talk about it. Um, but again, this is just a, a sample to give you guys stuff to look at. And I'll put the fish on since we have the water. SS is its successor. That's good to know. All right. Yeah. Netstat is a big part of security too, as well. Yeah. But we're not, we'll talk about it when I come back.
Oh. Yeah, be careful with all those what's my piece things. We're going to talk about that. Um, some of them, some of the what's my IP things are actually um, hacker tools that are trolling you for your IP. So, just might want to be careful about those. All right, we're back. So, one of the questions that comes up is, well, what's my IP? What's the IP of your computer? And I actually have some stuff on this. I'm not going to run it, obviously. I probably will on accident. Um, but, yes, you can use ifconfig. Uh, so, if you want to... Here's the problem. All right? Now, this is where understanding your home network comes in. And that's the other part of this. Okay? So, an internet is a network of networks. That's where the term comes from. And that is what the internet is. The internet is a network of networks. And so one of the really important things, we're going to talk about that for um, hopefully only a half an hour or so. Um, but how does your home network play into this whole internet thing? And you can think of everything I just told you about your post office and stuff sort of relates to your own home network, but it's largely different because there's it's more like a building with a mail room downstairs. Okay, so, you know, if you're a bank with a mail room, uh, all the mail goes to the mail room and it gets organized into the slot and it gets sent back to the person who it goes to, but it never really hits the internet. Okay, so, um, so that's important. Um, but and here's how you know that, because if you look at your own IP, so I'm not doxing my IP here by showing you this, and you can try this, IP space dash BR space A. This shows you your IP numbers for your computer on your home network or on wherever you are. And there's one a couple you have to know. This is so you can get the joke. Uh, there's a common joke out there. You can we actually have a, 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 a doormat that says there's no place like 127.0.0.1, and the reason for that is because in the old days, um, yeah, <laughs> attack. <laughs> this this IP number is a special IP number that's been given to your computer. It's called the loopback interface, and it's, it's usually got LO as an identifier, and this is your computer, right? So uh, what is an interface? So an interface is, <laughs> well, look at the ping on that. Uh, an interface is a connection to the internet or a connection to the network, not to the internet. And um, so this connection actually doesn't go anywhere but your computer. So this is gonna blow your mind, but you can think of your computer itself as its own network. So inside of your computer, pretend there lives a network inside of there. And this um, this is even more true when you have a virtual machine. That's what these are. Okay. So these virtual machines are something else that is living on a network that only exists within my computer. So my computer is like a little tiny network all by itself. Everything inside of there. And 127.0.01 is the address for that computer to itself. And you can use that every time I go to a uh, local host to, pre to pre pre preview my website, for example. Uh, I go to localhost 3000. Localhost is a built-in name uh, for 127.0.0.1. So maybe this um, can dispel some of the mystery for you. Uh, of course, this has got, I have to set that. So, so this represents your computer. Uh, the reason they're joking with you about attacking is because any communication with 127.0.1 never leaves your computer. But that's really, really great. Uh, there was actually, uh, I can't remember where it was, but there was a, there was actually, oh man, I wish I had the link to this. There was actually somebody who deployed an application to 127.0.0.1 to the internet and was wondering why it didn't work. And it was a big professional shing, shing ding or whatever. Anyway, so that's that's that number. And there's no domain name for it. The domain name is localhost and so it goes in. At one point it was actually called home and that's where the joke comes from. There's no place like 127.0.0.1 
put it on a t-shirt and other technologists you can identify them and see what they what they're talking about um uh the wlps this means this is a wi-fi uh interface and this is a connection to uh my my network this is the ip number that that my router has decided to give me and uh, the way it makes that decision is it uses its own protocol called Dynamic Host Control Protocol, DHCP. And uh, there is one other form of receiving these IP addresses um, when our devices come on the internet. It's called static, uh, but it's very rarely used these days. Uh, almost always, even when the number doesn't change very often, you, you're using something called DHCP. And what that is, is that means that my, my Wi-Fi router um, has decided to give me this number and that's going to come in later when you need to make sure that that number doesn't change. So say, for example, you want to run a Minecraft server from home, which is scary and dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, but if you were to do that, you'd want to make sure that that IP number, uh, could be, would not change. Um, so say somebody comes into your Wi-Fi and you let you give them the password for your Wi-Fi and they connect their phone. Uh, chances are they're going to get a random new number and that number will change. That's what's dynamic about it these other things are the vm nets these are caused by uh, my vmware uh, which adds a, a network inside of my computer and that's useful for for modeling uh, networks you can actually have multiple uh, virtual machines running at the same time and you can simulate uh, all kinds of things including network arp attacks and stuff uh, in these tiny little encapsulated spaces inside your computer on virtual machines um, yes, uh, so, um, there is, uh, but the, the thing I want to show you here, and I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go there, uh, but if you do a search for what's my IP, uh, if you go to it, Google or whatever like that, it will tell you a number and I want, I'm going to challenge you to go find out what your number is right now. Uh, that number that you get is not this number. You'll notice that they're different. I think, well, well, what's going on here? Uh, and the reason for that is because the IP number uh, that's associated with you is not just for you. It's called NAT, Network Address Translation. And you can think of it as being the address to your building, okay, your home. So your home, uh, you have a network and that network all has its own IP numbers and they're always going to start with 192 or 10 dot usually. Those are internally reserved IP ranges that are only for internal use. So uh, 10 dot is a much larger range and therefore it's used for um, companies and routers that have like, you know, really like thousands, if not millions of, um, of, of devices on the network. Uh, but mostly in your, most of your home networks, you're going to have 192.168.1, which you can almost memorize. And that by default only provides 255 uh, devices, give or take. And, and that's it. And so uh, most, most home devices will, will use that range. Uh, and these ranges are defined by, you know, big internet standards bodies that decide who's going to get what range. Uh, and if you're wondering, what's this other crazy number over here? Um, this is what's going to save us. We already ran out of IP numbers. We ran out of IP numbers a long time ago. What was it? Does anybody know? I think it was like five or six years ago. And so we've already started transferring over to a new system that uses a much, much, much bigger number. Um, and this, that's what this is. So, and I can't remember the exact number. I think it's in the, in the multi trillions. There's like more than the sands and the ocean IPv6 is called. So IPv5 or the original IP internet protocol, uh, only had so many numbers. I don't remember off the top of my head what they, how many. Um, but it would be, what's it to this, to the 24th, whatever that is, that's how many it is. Um, and so it's a big number. It's to the 24th. Um, and, and the, the, we ran, we knew we were going to run out. So we started, uh, copying and making them over to another one. So that's why you see these other numbers over here. And these, the, the number, the range of numbers for that is two to the 64th. And that's a pretty big number. Okay. So, and these, by the way, this is all, um, encoded with, um, uh, uh, bin hex, which counts from zero to nine and then a through E, uh, for the numbers 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So you should learn bin hex eventually. You will, if you do over the wire, you'll need to know all that stuff for Pico CTF to teach you that. So we're not going to get into how these numbers are formed, uh, right now, but just know that these numbers are just different ways of representing a bunch of ones and zeros. 
And that's ultimately what goes over the wire and what the internet computers understand. Um, and if you want to get into the weeds on that and understand it, make sure that, you know, you learn bin hacks and you learn octal and you learn, you know, that kind of thing. But we're going to cover that at many other topics. All right. So uh, the big takeaway here is what is my IP? And there's lots of ways of establishing that. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a really safe way that you can do it. Uh, there's a lot of services on the internet. The most reliable on the internet that is just whatever pulls up from Google or DuckDuckGo, it will tell you right off your bat what your number is. And that number, I just want to make a point about this, that number will be different than the number you looked at here on your home network. And that's because the number on the internet is the number for your building, not for your computer. This number is the number for your computer or device. The number on the internet is the number for your building, whether it's your home or any of the other building. And so the way the, the mail gets routed, the packets get routed, is they, they get sent to the router that's listening at that IP on that you saw on the internet. And that IP is where it gets the packet and goes, oh, okay, well, let's see where it goes here. And most of the time it doesn't go anywhere unless it started from, unless it's an answer, a response from something that came from, from inside of the network. It's a pretty amazing miracle of a technology, NAT, NAT Network Address Translation, because what it does is it sends out a packet from, a packet from my computer right here that goes to, you know, the router before it hits the internet. And then it goes out into the internet and then the internet, some service in the internet answers back and sends back a packet that's destined. But but my router remembers what packet it was. And it says, you know what? Oh, that's a response to this guy. So imagine if our postal system remembered every, and basically kept track of every single packet that left, package that left, and knew exactly who to send it back to uh, without knowing anything more about it. It's pretty dang cool technology because it comes all the way back and that's what NAT is. It allows us inside of our internal you know, house here, our building, our network, to send stuff out into the internet and make sure it'll come back to us without giving it any any real hints. And NAT is, is, is what is doing that. It's actually keeping track of all that stuff and sending it back to you. And um, it's, it's, it's pretty miraculous, actually. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how long it caches router packet metadata. I do not know that. Yeah, let's see. You did pay extra for confirmation, right? So so it comes back to you and you get your stuff the way you want. Uh, so now, but here's the problem. Okay, what if, what if somebody out on the internet wants to send your specific computer a package? Can't do it. Why not? Because it doesn't have, the router doesn't have anything to go on. So your router gets, let's say, some random, and this is, you know, this is the essence of attacking a network. It's like, let's say some random, you know, computer out there wants to send something to you. Maybe it wants to talk to your computer specifically. Maybe you want to SSH, which we're going to do. Maybe it tries to make an SSH, it can't do it. Because it gets to, it says, okay, I want this IP address. If, even if they know that, they may not know. But if they did, it would get to your home router. And your home router would go, I ain't never seen this packet before. I have no idea where it goes, right? And other than it requesting a specific place, a door called a, a port, which we'll talk about, it it has no way. And so it's like, I'm sorry, I don't have anywhere to send that. You go down here, go to throw it away. And unless you tell your router, hey, send all the stuff that we don't know about it to this particular machine, then it will just throw it away. It's like, and that's what, that's what, it, that's how it's protecting you from unwanted in, incoming connections is it doesn't know how to do that. DMZ, we won't talk about a DMZ demilitarized zone. That's a way of setting up, uh, kind of a, a, a no man's zone between your router and the connection to the internet where you can put other devices inside of that space, um, that are, that are, that can be exposed to more security risk, but you're nice and safe usually, uh, inside of your home network. Okay. And that's because your router is protecting you and you really don't want to ever mess with that. This is why you want to make sure that your router, the default admin password and everything have been changed because anybody attacking you can attack your router. And that's the most they can attack unless you allow them to attack more explicitly, unless you go in and say, 
I you I want all the packets uh, for Secure Shell to go to the server. I want to allow Minecraft to come through. Anybody who tries to connect on an incoming Minecraft connection, I want it to go to that computer over in the corner that's running my Minecraft server. Okay, and that's how it does it. And the, one of the ways, um, uh, let me just want to show you one way that you can from the command line you can show how to uh, look up your IP number. I just don't remember. I don't use it that much, and I certainly don't want to run it right now. Um, so is it? I, no, it's not IPs. Well, I'll look it up later. But but um, it uses dig. It's, oh, my IP. There it is. My IP. So this is this is uh, what you can do. It's one. I'll go ahead and send this to you. Um, actually, I'll just send you the whole thing. So if you want this, this is a, a nice, safe way to use Dig to look up your IP. Uh, but there are lots of other ways to do that. Um, okay, so uh, the last thing we have to talk about here is ports. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, so when you're connecting, so the closest thing to compare a port to in our comparison here is the door and the word port in French means door so you can think of it as the door so let's say uh, you send a package someplace or someone sends you a package right and it comes to your building and you have two or three or four doors maybe you have a service entrance maybe you have a special entrance for VIPs maybe you have uh, the main entrance right uh, and so the postman or the post person they, they come to your building and they have a package and they don't know where it goes. They don't know which door to take it to. Okay, so by default, they might go to one. But but what a port is, is a port is a specification. You can consider it the number above the door. Okay, so in the world, um, uh, uh, yes. And there are a certain, I think there's only 32,000 or so. Um, I think it's, was it 2 to the 8th, 2 to the 16th? Um, Anyway, these are the ports, and there are specific ports that have been assigned in advance, so everybody agrees on them. For example, port 80. So anytime you ever go to a website, you can put colon 80 at the end of it, HTTP colon slash slash blah 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 port 80, if they support uh, non-secure HTTPS. So there's two ports that are really important for the web. One of them is port 80, and the other one is port 443. And 443 is HTTPS. That's the encrypted, secure version of HTTP that everybody should be using for the most part. So this means that when that package comes to the door of the building, you know, it got there because it knows the IP, it then says, okay, well, where do I go now? And it looks at the building and sees, okay, these, there's 443 over here. It's got guards on it. That's for secure. So it takes it to the secure and gives the, gives the security door of the package. And then, and then, you know, it, it does with it, whatever. If it's not, it goes to the main, you know, HTTP door. Um, if it's uh, 22, which is an SSH, that's what SSH uses. It connects to that, to that port. And you'll notice something when you do over the wire and you hack and stuff like that. And another one you'll see here. Is like you notice how I'm connecting to uh, 127.0.0.1.3000 to preview my website while I develop it, and that's because any port, and this is just a random port that my previewer browser sync chose to use um, to display my web page to me on my machine only, not to other places, and it picked the number above. Uh, I think it's 10.24. Uh, because any number above 10 to 24 is non-privileged, that means that any application out there can just decide it wants to bind to that port. That means listen for new coming connections on that port and um, without a problem. Anything under 10 24 needs root access to your system. And they're having fun with this because port 21 is Telnet, uh, which is an insecure. You should never use it. Uh, is it 10 24? Yep. And they're registered with I. Yeah, they're also registered. Yeah, a lot of them are registered. Um, 23 is Telnet. I was going to say 21 is 21 FTP. So if you want to look up all these ports and you care, uh, which is kind of fun because when somebody tries to connect to you, uh, you can you can open up Etsy Services. I think it is. So Etsy Services has all of the ports in here. Uh, these are different ports that you can use by name instead of instead of um, so you can use colon SSH instead or instead of colon 22 if you were going to do that. Uh, so then it has all of our different ports. 
Okay. And there's an, another link. Thanks for me go. So, um, this is, that's, that's been kind of a quote. Uh, anybody know the port for Minecraft? Can they say it off the top of their head? 25565. <laughs> I got to memorize it at this point. So the port for Minecraft is 25565. The port for IRC, anybody know? 6667. You know, um, uh, malware runs on different ports uh, too. And so um, a lot of times when you, this is important because when you, for security perspective, when you see a lot of things trying to connect to different ports, uh, you'll, you'll get to see uh, what's what's going on and you'll be able to, to figure um, stuff out based on what it's trying to connect to uh, and you can also have some fun with this so um, I will confess that a bunch of my my guys people um, were being stopped by their school district from accessing remote SSH servers uh, that we were using to learn how to code and stuff and they were regularly very bored uh, but their their school district blocked port 22, which did not allow them to make an outbound SSH connection. And so what we did is we ran an SSH server on a normally a web port. So skillstack.sh for a very long time uh, was port, um, f was it 4443? And people could, could make an incoming connection to uh, to that and and then their the school district thought it was just more web traffic and didn't care uh, and I noticed that they do this on on uh, I can't remember if it's over the wire trying to hack me uh, hack the box or over the, or, or Pico CTF one of them does the same thing so you need to understand this idea of ports uh, okay so so that's that's been kind of an overview on networking um, I don't know where we are in our time uh, we're about halfway through um, and I have a feeling uh, that we're not going to be able to get deeply into uh, VPNs, and but I do want to mention them. It's almost impossible for me to, to illustrate the VPN here, uh, but I do want to make you aware of them. And we'll talk about personal security, and I do want to show you KeePassXD really quick. Uh, I just want to make you aware of it. Okay, so clicking on getting started again, uh, and then we're on day five. So at this point, you have a general uh, idea of how the internet works and how your home networks work. Um, uh, and your the stuff there. There's another address out there. It's called the ARP address or the machine address or the MAC address, and you just need to know about it. Um, what uh, what that is is that is the actual in the old days it was literally soldered or not soldered, but like burned into uh, your network device on your computer. And that was the the hardware address uh, because the guy, the postman or whoever person has got to have some place to, the, the package says go to this address, but then when they say, no, 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 you need to get to that address, you need to go to this, to this post office. And so in order to tell uh, the person delivering uh, the package to the next place where to go, they had to have an address for that place. And the address for that place is equivalent to the MAC address. And the MAC address is a big old long address, an ARP address. Uh, it's, it's a protocol. It is, it's, it, yeah, ARP is a protocol. Mac, but the MAC address is the old name for it. Um, but it's, it used to be uh, that it was, you know, that that was what identified. So it's easier to think of it that way, even though it's now moved on to, it's also sort of assigned and it can be changed. And in this world of virtual machines, you can change it and make it whatever you want. Um, but the idea originally was that, uh, it would be, that would be the, the way to always address that specific device. So, uh, so even in your own home, uh, Mac changer. Yeah. So even in your own home, uh, you would have an IP address as we just saw, uh, but the, but the, um, the ARP address and for this, you need IF config. Um, so here we see on my network. So here's the internet address, right? So that's the address within my own little network here. Uh, this tells me how many numbers I get to use. Uh, and this is if you want to send something to everybody. And then we have here, this is the INET v6, the big old long one. Uh, and then we have the Ethernet address or the MAC address or the ARP address. That's They're all named different thing. And that's what this is. So this is this is the address of this computer's device. And each device has a different one. Uh, 
And that is like the definitive way to send a packet to something. And both of those addresses are on the package. You can imagine the package uh, receiving a new stamp every time it goes to the post office. So when it goes, so the first stamp it gets is you need to go to my own post office. So the address of the post office is written on that. And then the post office gets it, crosses out, effectively crosses it out, really unpackages it, but it crosses out that address and writes the address of the next place for it to go. And then it goes to that place. And then that one gets crossed out and it writes the address of the next place to go. Now the IP on it doesn't change. The destination address never ever changes, but all of these intermediate addresses are added to the to the packages that's getting sent along. That That is what is going on with the Ethernet Mac slash ARP address. Uh, okay. When you come we come along with ARP address for the rest, it doesn't matter. Uh, for those who want to become network guys, it's MAC address. They will not take you seriously when you come along with ARP address. Uh, okay, that's fine. It is MAC address. We'll call it Mark MAC address. Uh, the, the, the problem is that ARP is the protocol, and but a lot of people have been calling it ARP address for a very long time. So thanks for the clarification. Um, Ethernet is what it says here. But MAC address or machine address, we'll just remember that and maybe we won't sound stupid. Uh, Mac, yeah, Mac slash ARP. Yeah, so that's good. I like I like that we have a pedantic network guy in the audience because we need to make sure to get this right. Books call it also a MAC address, right? Uh, but also HA protocols rely on MAC addresses. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, so yeah, so we'll just call it, we'll call it and right here. If you're looking at this, just know it's not, if you look for Mac, you're not going to see anything. You're going to see ethernet address. And so we'll, we'll call that the ethernet machine address. How's that? And then we'll say that it, it can use the ARP protocol to assign it. Um, ARP is the protocol for, for telling the whole world what machine address, Mac address goes with a given IP address. Okay, so that's that's what's going on there, and I I think that's probably all we should say about that because I don't want to get deeper into the words. If you've ever heard of the term an ARP attack, uh, what it's doing an ARP attack is flooding the local network with with basically messages saying I'm trying to keep this simple. Uh, it's flooding the whole network saying, yeah, I'm the one, I have that address. That's my MAC address. That's my MAC address. That's my MAC address. And the person, the, the, the machine who actually has the machine address is over here and he doesn't answer very much. And so the ARP attack is like saying, Hey, I've got the, I swear, I swear I'm the one who has it. And then, and then, and then it will, um, <laughs> oh boy, you received 280 gigabit data transmitting. Oh boy. Yes. Uh, and and so the the point is is that that um that we have a lot of I didn't even see those stats before. That's really great. Thanks for Greg pointing those out. That's about that's pretty much my my bandwidth too. So I'm glad that showed that. So a, a broadcast storm. Another broadcast. So if you mess with one of the things you can do with your network to mess it up is to make it so that your router doesn't know what's going on. You know, and none, and none of the computers know what's going on. They don't know who to talk to. They don't have to talk to the router for everything. They should be able to talk to each other directly. And if you start messing on your local area network by saying, hey, I swear I am the one. Have anybody ever had an, a mistake that says somebody already has that MAC address on your network, right? And MAC spoofing, another technique is ARP flooding. MAC spoofing and ARP flooding, which overflows the switches and then therefore the switches get flood. Yeah. So if you're going to go into pen testing uh, and you know, network protocols. These are really important things. I'm sure um, Bob would have something to say about uh, creating packet storms. Uh, you can actually really mess your network up with a packet storm by by messing up your switches. This is why the network engineers make so much money. Um, if you and this is again why I would suggest that you either use a VPN and have. I mean, you have a virtual machine. Sorry, not a VPN. Uh, or you go to your local community college because they will set up scenarios where you can like break the network by flooding it with packets. Um, is it illegal to spoof a MAC address? I don't know. No, I don't think it is. So it happens all the time. <laughs> it happens constantly. So a man in the middle attack is usually started by flooding the network with those messages so that the computers on the network think you are the router and all of a sudden they send everything to you and once they cache that they're fine to do it as long as they get responses and then you forward the traffic onto the router 
and you look at all the traffic and do whatever you want with it. And then you forward the return responses to everybody. You basically make your computer turn your little device, your, your hacker device into a man in the middle router and you can see every single thing that they're doing. And it's pretty amazing when you do it. <laughs> we did this in a security camp once and there was, there was a tool in Cali. It showed us every single web page anybody on the network requested. It would literally sit there and show us each picture and each page as it re, as it as it was being requested, because man in the middle, and it was because it was a lot of them were unencrypted. So so again, this is why you should always look for the HTTPS in your websites to protect yourself from a man in the middle attack. Um, I can't remember if that was the tool. I really don't know, but it was really amazing. Um, this is also the reason, by the way, coincidentally, that when you set up an SSH key. It says, are you sure you trust this IP address? Because if there's any chance at all that you're being subjected to a man in the middle attack, you're about to give that information to the man in the middle instead of the, the service that you want to use. And so that's actually one of the weaknesses of, of the initial SSH thing. And there was a presentation from a local uh, meetup about how they're trying to get around that. There is a way to get around that through certificate signing and stuff. Um, but it's very, very complicated and not something we want to talk about right now. All right. So the last thing on, the on, on here, um, uh, I wanted to try to use a secure cell connection. Uh, I'm going to skip this and I'm going to suggest that you, I'm going to, I'm going to send you to one place where you're going to learn all about this and I don't need to tell you anything more. Uh, so please do, um, over the wire. I'm not going to, I'm just going to skip it because this is easily something you can do, uh, over the wire.org. Uh, and do bandit and do the first three the first five levels all of them have to do with ssh okay and i'm just going to tell you what ssh is but this will help you practice using it so and it also will help you practice using your ports because they have you connect to a different port from the standard port and we're going to get to vpn that's why i want to get to that so um uh uh so secure shell what is secure shell uh, it's on your system right here. Secure Shell is a program for logging into a remote machine and for executing commands on the remote machine. So it's basically a terminal on a remote system. So you you have a terminal and then you SSH into that other terminal and then you can have a connection to that system. So um, I have actually one set up right now. Uh, if I were to connect, so I'm now connected to my local system and I can then exit and now I'm no longer connected. Okay, if I wanted to connect to Pico CTF, I could SSH into Pico, and now I have a connection on a system in Carnegie Mellon. Uh, with how many other users do you think are over here today, guys? OS dash one. So, oh my gosh, they're up to 39,000. Last I checked, there were 36,000 users. So, this is the Pico CTF server, which you can connect to using SSH. Uh, if you do, make sure you use a VPN because if you don't, it'll give up your IP number. It'll talk to your IP number. We're going to talk about that now. Uh, uh, I don't use Putty at all. No one needs to use Putty anymore. Sorry. Don't really need it. War games and then Bandit. Yep. So Bandit is the first war game that I suggest. Uh, so over the wire, war games slash Bandit. And it's a very, uh, the first few levels are pretty basic. Actually, all of the levels are basic. Uh, the last levels are pretty tough though. So go ahead and do that. That'll help you practice your terminal things. It's really fun too. Um, uh, I, you'll see me playing Wargame when I'm not preparing for the beginner boost. I am playing Over the Wire or Pico or Hack the Box. And it's really fun. It's just a fun way to use your terminal. Uh, one of the reasons I really like Over the Wire is you can use links. You can use links to view Over the Wire. In fact, I probably have some here still. Bandit. Do I have any in my... Nope. Nope, they've all been gone. Bandit is also over the wires recommended box to start with. Yep. So, and you can you can actually, what I'm trying to say is you can actually do uh, over the wire from links. Uh, I, this is one of the best things about this, uh, this server. This server is extremely links friendly. See this? I mean, it is one of the best. I love it. I love it. In fact, they have contributions. When I start to contribute um, ha uh, uh, capture the flag kind of games eventually, this is where I'm going to contribute them because they have the good sense of not making their site dependent on JavaScript, which I really hate about Hack the Box and Over the Wire. They're beautiful interfaces, absolutely spectacularly well done, but if, if I don't think it's needed. It's just a war game. You don't need it. Uh, links run slow to you because you have something un misconfigured. 
uh, th that's it runs in nanoseconds for me, and it never has. Uh, make sure you're running Lynx. Um, but that if you if you do Lynx over to over the wire like that, and I mean that took a few seconds. That's 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 the opposite of slow to me. And there's something else going on with your network. You probably need to look at it. Maybe you have an old version or configuration that's off. Make sure you try that configuration I have too. It's turned off some of the other services. All right, so uh, let's go back to, and we can help you in the in the in the Discord if you need. So, uh, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, um, the, they're all saved, and if you go to rwx.gg, anybody who's missed the boosts, go to rwx.gg uh, and go to click on the schedule and go to day one, and the videos are linked from here. Uh, the videos are linked from here in day four. You click on the TV, you can go watch the video for the day. Uh, and those will be recycled out as we go through. All right, so SSH here, we have practical SCP. So SCP is a way of transferring files uh, that uses SSH. So I have, let's say I wanted to take my EEX program and I want to put my EEX program on my Pico CTF system. Okay, so I can do that. I can do SCP uh, EEX uh, to Pico. And... Um, I have to have put a colon in there, I think. And that's going to make a copy of it and put it over on the system. And I SSH back into Pico. And um, if I do an LS over here, it take a while. But if I do an LS, now I have the EEX program. So the EEX program is on the remote system. See how fast that was? Uh, in fact, SCP is definitely a must-have in your tool set because it's a way of copying them back and forth together. Uh, uh, rsync with SSH uses SCP. Um, essentially, it's essentially the same thing. The only difference is rsync is um, changing the, um, you know, keeping the the files uh, synchronized in terms of like an entire directory, uh, or if you want the permissions to match the deltas and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm I just use SCP for almost everything. If you're setting up a backup, if you're setting up a backup, then definitely use rsync. Um, but, but yeah, curl does not upload files as far as I'm aware. Curl is, I've only used, I've only seen curl used for downloading stuff, right? So, and it's, by the way, curl is also from a public system. SCP is for connecting to things to which you have SSH access. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's a nice thing. Nice comment from Ramingo on dual stack. Um, uh, we're not going to see we, we covered DNS, which is the name. I think we covered everything on networking. So if I missed anything, feel free to ask. Uh, this guide is kind of what's keeping me on track here. Um, we uh, I, I actually moved links uh, to today, which I'm going to skip because we covered it yesterday. Um, I think I'm probably going to move it back now because I can't find enough places for this. Um, if you're having any trouble configuring links, uh, I'm probably going to need it. It's going to need its own video. I did make a video for it already. Uh, and it's called the terminal browsers for the wind. It's on the YouTube site. Um, you can practice setting that up. Um, and I, I need to skip through it though, because we're running out of time uh, and then we can come back and review things that people have questions on. Um, and what do we got here? Oh, personal privacy and, and saving. Okay. So now that you know, uh, how to see things out there, uh, and find IPs and stuff. Well, why is it bad for me to know, for somebody to know my IP number? Well, the first step of hacking any system is knowing where it is. And so giving up that IP number, this is why it's a banning offense for somebody to post an IP number into my chat. And they've done it. People will think it's funny to, to post somebody else's IP uh, to the middle of some random Twitch thing and say, oh, hey, go attack this person. Uh, it's so easy to break into systems these days because most of the routers are not configured. When's the last time anybody here has updated their router? You know, um, and it's so easy to break into systems these days that that it's it's kind of irresponsible to give up somebody's uh, there you go IP number uh, to to everyone in there that is making fun because that's not an actual internet number. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know they're saved. I know, and I have to go change this thing. Please don't hack me. Uh, just, I'm just going to put that out there again. Please don't hack me. If you hack me, I will stop doing all of this and go back to doing whatever I want to do. Um, and then if you want to test me on that, that's fine. But I, I'll tell you this. If you do hack me, I will find you. <laughs> okay, so just don't. Um, so 
uh, also the crack the 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 virtual private network. So let's talk about virtual private networks for a second. Um, there, so virtual private networks are a way for you to to hide your IP, and unfortunately for we streamers, for us streamers, um, we can't hide our IPs because if we hide our IPs, we cannot stream. And I haven't tested it with the streams, but I've done enough research to know that if you want a good quality stream, I can't hide my IP in order to do it. Molvod is a fantastic VPN. That's the one I use. Um, I also use ProtonMail. Uh, so we're going to talk about VPN services. Uh, I am not going to go into how to configure your VPN at all uh, because I can't show that to you because it would give up lots of information. Uh, and it would also just expose too much about how what I use. The fact that you already know that I use Molvod and ProtonMail VPN has defeated the purpose of using a VPN for me. And I'm willing to take the hit for the community, but I want to tell you right now, don't tell people what VPN you use. Okay? Um, if you're going to recommend a VPN to someone, the whole point of the VPN is to hide your activity on the internet so that people can attack you and so that other people cannot pry on your privacy and see what you're doing. Now, I'm not there's look, th this is okay. So, so, <laughs> so there's, there's, there's basic privacy, which keeps you from being attacked. You know what I mean? And then there's secrecy. And I want to, I want to make a point about this. And before we go here, I'm actually supposed to finish in two more minutes. Uh, and you guys can debate these topics. There's a difference between privacy and secrecy. Privacy is what keeps freedom alive. It's what keeps people alive. It's what keeps journalists alive. It's what keeps people during dissident times alive. Privacy is a good thing. Secrecy is a different thing and it can be good or bad. People can use secrecy to hide crimes. They can use secrecy to what you define to be a crime. They can use secrecy to hide terrorism. They can hide all kinds of things with secrecy. Please stop conflating the two. People are saying, oh, well, you got anything to hide? You don't get anything to hide. You know what? Neither do most journalists all over the world. But you know what they're hiding? They're hiding the fact that they are broadcasting the truth. And if all of us do not stand up for privacy, our world will be destroyed because the people who want to control the world will continue to dominate it. So it's very important. And if you don't, if you want to watch a video on this, I'll put it in the in the the, the learning projects. But watch the video from the guy who made ProtonMail, I forget his name now, uh, on TED. And he talks about that we will not even remember what the word privacy means in five years if we don't act now. This is why, Andy Yen, thank you. This is why it's so important that you take a moment to ask yourself the question, do I care about privacy and why should I care? For everyone, not just for you, okay? For everyone, for the people all over the world. And the reason that privacy is, is a problem right now is the people who who practice privacy are automatically suspected of of hiding things in secret and so they become suspect and that actually also makes it a reason that you should not disclose to people that you're using a virtual private network you shouldn't even tell them you're using one now we should assume everybody's using one but if you tell them that you are using one and that you're using one and it's a particular type Anybody who's watching you who knows you now knows if somebody wants to violate your privacy, let's say whether it's an illegal, it's a, it's a mob, a hacker mob, or it's, you know, your government, how are they going to violate your privacy? They're going to find out, well, he just said he uses this VPN. All right, let's track all the VPNs within that radius for a hundred mile radius. This is how they caught every hacker. Let's, let's track all the, the, the VPNs, the people that have used that VPN from every coffee shop within the last you know year. And they triangulate that, they centralize their search and they catch people. This is how the NSA and everybody does it all the time. They regularly catch you. And let me just say one more time, if you think you can be anonymous, you should stop right now. You can do your very best to protect your privacy and to make it hard for people, but somebody who wants to find you will find you. 
they will find you. It's almost impossible for you to hide yourself. The level of spycraft required for you to truly hide your identity and to hide your activities is monumental. And I guarantee you there's nobody watching this stream right now that has any clue about how to properly save their, their, their privacy and, their, and, and to remain anonymous. There's just the, the amount of effort that it truly requires to do that. And, and the, the people who get, who get busted all the time, they're, they're getting busted because they think that they can actually, they can actually do this. Yeah. So, so they like, oh, I'll go to the coffee shop and I'll use my Mova VPN. I'll be sneaky. No, dude, that's like kindergarten to catch that. It's so easy to catch that. So yeah, if you, <laughs> you know, even this thing isn't safe. Okay. Look, what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, you can do your best to advocate for privacy, and I think you should do that. I still think you should use a VPN. I think you should do all of those things. <laughs> um, but um, I also, I also don't think that it's possible for most mortal human beings, including the really smart hackers, to save themselves from somebody who really wants to find out what they're doing and cra grab them on privacy. Uh, exit voting to <laughs> during a dictatorship. Yeah, that's that's a good point. You you might like who's in power now, but the person who's in power tomorrow might not be. And I, you know, I was a Russian major. I studied a lot. I lived in Russia for many years. Uh, I've lived abroad. I've lived in the Caribbean. I've lived, you know, I I, I spoke French. Uh, I've actually met spies. Um, you know, some of which I've talked about on stream. Some of them were retired. Some of them were not retired. Uh, I have, I have, I have people who work in the FBI that I know. And what I'm trying to tell you is that, uh, yeah, most of, most of Tor is NSA honeypots. So, uh, Tor, yeah, every, every single, so, so, uh, the reason I'm, I'm spending so much time on this topic is because there's a lot of people who like this hacker spy motif and that's fine. It's fun to do all of these things, but I don't want anybody to go away thinking that you can truly get away with doing something and not be caught because if somebody wants to catch you they will and and you know uh, uh, you would really really have to be like a you know decades of training in spycraft to not be caught and and that involves a lot of things and that's why we like shows like mr robot because they're complete fantasy <laughs> It's a fun fantasy, but it's a total fantasy. They would have caught they would have caught Mr. Robot in the first week. <laughs> I mean seriously, they would have caught him in the first week. He's, I mean, he does stuff that would easily have got himself caught like that. But, you know, it's fun. It's a fun Yeah, Snowden's book is awesome and that's where I'm pulling a lot of this from actually, guys. So a lot of this is a lot of my knowledge about this is coming from Snowden's book. Um and and it's it's yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty scary and interesting at the same time. So should you have a VPN? Yes. Uh, what VPN you have up to you. Uh, again, I'm doxing myself here. I already have, I'm on stream every day. I think I've doxed my IP even. Uh, and this is where I'm just running on trust. Also don't live in fear. Stop living in fear, everybody. Live, you know, the, for the day, you know, carpe diem, seize the day. Um, you don't need to live in the fear that you're going to, you know, unless you truly are, some people probably have to be. Um, anyway, so we have uh so you can use your vpn uh if you want a vpn that cannot be tracked in any way uh you can use molvod vpn uh but that you can pay in cash flow for that vpn but i promise you if you use molvod you're going to be like one of like five people within the whole state who uses it and <laughs> and if anybody knows that you're using it they'll find you because you'll be one of the only ones using it uh, they don't have to go raid molvod you know, and, and get its records, which they don't have any of, by the way, because you never give them any information about yourself at Mobile. Uh, but if you're using open VPN and you just want to basically keep your IPs safe from script kitty hackers, then that's the, a good use for that. And frankly, to tell you the truth, that's one of the reasons that, you know, I'm not as afraid to have my IP doxed. I, I do not want it doxed. Uh, but if, 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 if anybody dared to attack me, on my IP, um, the good chances it would be a script kitty and they would seriously go down. I've caught hackers before. And, and so, yeah, I'm just saying, just saying, you've been warned, you know, and we should not live in fear, uh, but we should be aware uh, of things. And, um, you know, so just, just letting you know. Uh, it's a very specific set of skills. <laughs> I'm actually not not as good as as people that I've met, but I know people who are. <laughs> so, 
So I'm just going to put it like that. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so let's go on. Let's see. Uh, Mass Polymorph subbed. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Mass. On par with Cribs on security. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Break time. Yes. Sorry. I'm like way, way past my break. Um, and, and then uh, we're going to do... So yeah, so the VPN again uh, and keep SXC. Uh, I am not going to set keep SXC up on the stream. Uh, keep SXC is a rather advanced thing to use. I do strongly recommend it, uh, and I'm going to leave it up to you as an exercise to to practice using it and 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 do that. Okay, and uh, I do need a break. <laughs> Yes, AFK.
talking with my my wife, the uh, former postal police. We were talking about all this post office stuff and all the security stuff and the privacy stuff. Ah. Okay. The most comfy. Two proton mail emails, one is for recovery, one is the other. Um, I actually, if you um, pay the five bucks or whatever it is to get proton mail, uh, you can use several of them. And I don't mind sharing the strategy I have of using, hey Gabe, of using um, one uh, address for things that I don't want people to guess, um, and then another one for uh, public, and then I have uh, another one that is secret which uh, I don't tell anybody. I mean, you know, so, uh, and that, that one is used for authenticating against, against things that um, I really, really don't want anybody to know about. Uh, let's see. Major breaches in state agencies. Yes. Yep. 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 In fact, you can see that my, my wife was just telling me that she was no, uh, she was um, notified of a, of a breach on uh, her, credit report so your credit report uh sometimes contains even though the credit agencies themselves got breached one of the biggest breaches in history um everybody's information from equifax was uh made public um it actually wasn't made public it didn't show up anywhere but it was it was compromised but to this day they don't know where it is it's kind of an interesting uh, rabbit hole if you want to study that uh you know one of the biggest uh databases to ever be breached and none of the data ever showed up on the dark web at all so people are like, well, what's going on? Why isn't this stuff going to be public? Any other kind of breach would show up immediately for sale. Um, so lots of, there's one article I read that suggested maybe state actors involved. Uh, they're using it for recruiting. I don't know. Interesting stuff. Anyway, let's go back to, yeah. Yeah. I actually, that's, that's my theory. I have nothing to go on. My theory is that China breached Equifax. Did you, you know what else I read? This is just the last two days. Um, you know this whole thing about ports and everything? Start up, start up a SSH server on port 22 on, on DigitalOcean or someplace and log all of the attempted connections by IP. And then ask yourself where those IPs are coming from. Almost all of the uh, you know, bots that are trying to connect to things, are, most in the States anyway, most of them are coming from China. And uh, from this is anecdotal. This is just what I every time I can run into somebody who's talking about all the stuff that's getting logged, uh, it's getting yeah, Tor China network is 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 connecting. So, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, some, yeah, you can yeah, you can use links to bypass. I actually made a video on that. A lot of times you can use links to bypass the JavaScript that's gonna put the paywall up. That's not hacking. All right. Um, uh, learning to learn. So this is kind of a, a fun time. This is just the last 40, 50 minutes. Um, and uh, I had a whole week to find for this before. And um, so I want to shift gears a little bit. I know this stuff is fun to talk about. Um, and I really love the security topics. You know me. Um, in fact, I do hope that many of you will take on your skills that you learn from Beginner Boost and consider careers uh, in the security field. Um as we've seen in the stats that I showed you on target occupations, uh, you can go to occupations on rwx.occupations and you can see that security analyst is the number one fastest growing, fastest needed, uh, you know, in greatest need uh, security profession. I do hope uh, that a lot of you will take your beginner boost skills and pursue a career as a security analyst in some form. Um, that's my, my hope for the world is that we'll start to see more people, uh, doing this. Somebody on Twitter just released a book called hacking for dummies that is flying off the shelves, according to the author. And he's like, wow, I didn't realize what a great demand there is for this information. Um, and I don't believe it's to hack people. I think it's more about, uh, becoming, uh, you know, a pen tester or becoming a forensic person or whatever. Uh, software developer, of course, and then web developer. So, so as we kind of wind up the week here, InfoSec is very stressful. Uh, it takes, and it's a lot of hard work. Um, and it takes the kind of skills that are not the same as sitting in a room and coding. Um, I actually watched um, our our good friend and streamer, who I cannot remember right now, so I'm going to type his name. Uh, 
uh, was it the Primean, uh, who works for Net uh, Netflix. I don't see him on right now. It's the Premian. Premian, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And um, anyway, uh, I was reminded that uh, there are jobs for yeah, Prim Primagian, Prim Primagian, yeah. The Primagian, he's he's really fun. He's really really fast coder, by the way, much faster than me. Uh, I, I'm gonna have to say he's not as deliberate as I am, uh, but he's 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 really fun to watch, and I really appreciated him rating me the other day. Uh, but the, the reason I bring him up is because he's a good example of somebody you can watch who codes all day, every day in one language and he's working on performance. Um, and so there, there is a need for that. There definitely is a need for that. But that is a different set of skills uh, from you know the hacker mentality where you're constantly figuring things out and thinking about alternative ways of doing things. Uh, and so this... Um, yeah, he's got, you know, his memory is okay. Just be careful about his vimisms. He has a lot of vimisms. And if you don't know what a vimism is, go to RWX Rob, RWX.gg, sorry, and then um, slash vimism. And look, uh, I've, my, if you're going to use a vimism, just know you're getting what you're getting into. You're basically turning VI into Emacs. And as soon as you do that, if you want to use just VI on one system, great. Uh, but you are robbing yourself of the muscle memory that'll work on all systems everywhere if you want to maintain that focus. Just know what you're getting into. Um, I, I somehow get, I a lot of times get triggered uh, by people who use VI like Emacs because it defeats the purpose to me. Um, but if that's your approach, I suppose that's fine. And I'm kind of backing off on, on judging it as harshly as I have the last couple, couple days. Um, so anyway, I just know what you're getting into. Um, so I, you know, if you, if you are, if your brain is such that you can know that you're, if you're going to use visual mode and all the fancy, awesome things that Primage, Primage and, uh, Primage and uses. And it, by the way, he's made an entire game. He's making a whole game about playing VI that uses the console only using, and he's writing the entire thing in TypeScript. Uh, it's a really cool project. Uh, I, I, I was kind of joking with him. I was like, I just want everybody to know, take a moment here and look at how dense this TypeScript is because <laughs> it is just as unreadable as bash code. And <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, so yeah. Yeah. So it was just, it was just really, really fun. I really enjoyed watching the stream last night. Um, and I, but back to this idea about what you're going to pick as a job and learning to learn and becoming an autodidact. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation on the stream about this and there will continue to be conversation about uh, learning to learn. In fact, every Sunday um, from 11 to noon uh, is a mentor's coffee uh, and Scream and I and a bunch of others uh, get on Discord and we talk about mentoring. We talk about being a mentor. We talk about, um, you know, how to mentor. And it occurred to me this week that because we talk about it every week, I didn't need to spend an entire week talking about how to learn. And, and as long as those who want to tune in uh, can kind of explore options for themselves about what that means for them um, and what is an autodidact. And so uh, I'm going to I'm going to go back to a more minimal approach to 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 this and i i'm in many ways i'm pulling myself back on a lot of things because i want to let you learn it i don't want to be the guy telling you what it is i want to show you where it is and let you discover it i don't want to rob you of the fun of learning what a thing is uh it's i'm sorry it's 11 it's 11 to 12 it's 11 to 12 on sundays and it it will start going up on youtube our last one is up uh, and it's more of a talk show. Uh, we're just all talking in there and exchanging ideas. We had a really great one last week, by the way. Og was on there and Screen was on there. Um, and um, that's a couple other people. Uh, I don't lock down the Discord, so we can just anybody can come join in and tune in and share their voice. Um, we get some educators there during that time as well. Uh, so, so yeah. So let's see what else we got here. Um, so we did remote show. And uh, so learning to learn. Um, there are a few major things that I want to make sure that I talk about um, in the sense of I like sharing things so that you know that they exist and then you can go dig deep and learn about the thing. A lot of times you don't know to even dig about something. And that's kind of what I've 
fulfill my role is here is to make you aware of things uh, so then you can do your own learning. And and one of those things is how to learn. So uh, live in the question. Don't be satisfied with quick answers. I love this quote. Questions lead us on a quest. This quote, by the way, is from uh, MC Yogi's um, uh, Spiritual Graffiti, which is a fantastic, fantastic book if you like to read <laughs> uh and it's a it's real life it's his own account his life should be turned into a movie i swear to god he's been in major car wrecks three times uh he's been thrown in uh to you know juvie he was kicked out of juvie because it was too bad uh he how he met his his wife it's just how he came to yoga so it's it's something i'm going to plug uh because i think it, it's relating to this learning to learn thing and this quote is from the book um uh, how to learn assembly on Linux. I would suggest exorcism.io would be the first way to go look for that. Uh, and then I would, the second recommendation I would be, would be, um, cause I'm learning assembly myself, uh, would be, uh, something called Google, uh, Gulagum, Gulagum, Gulagum. If you search for Gulagum, you can get a Gulagum training board and it comes with, uh, 20 pages of, or 20 uh, assembly lessons that teach you how to code microchip pick processors uh, with assembly. So that's a specific question there. Back to the topic at hand, learning to work and learn. Uh, learning is fundamental. Whatever your views on life and its purpose, it's likely that learning, uh, the process of gaining skill, knowledge, and experience is a fundamental part of it. Perhaps you believe that, l- that learning is the life's main goal. Maybe you simply seek enjoyment and simply enjoy learning. Maybe uh, you seek... S- Maybe you seek to inflict pain on others and still depend on learning how to do it. Learning is fundamental. It is also a skill and that itself can be learned and must be learned to masters. These days, learning requires reading, writing, and executing. And this, it's not a mistake that I picked RWX. Um, it's funny because I've been following this kind of mantra already and it just turned out that the letters were the same as the permissions. And they are also the same as my primary project in the world, README World Exchange. Um, so it works out rather nicely. Um, but if you, there are uh, down at the bottom of this page here, uh, slash learning, rwx.gg slash learning, uh, you can see there's two free Udemy courses, which you have to enroll for. I have not yet done so. Uh, and you can actually study how to learn. Uh, and there's lots of books on it. Uh, there's books from the, the guy from Searching for Bobby Fischer, uh, who, the chess champion turned Tai Chi master. Uh, there's a good book from him. There's just tons and tons of books um, on how to learn and how to become an autodidact. And um, But that's, you know, learning that is for you. I will suggest, though, that... Um, the, the X, RWX actually happens in kind of reverse order. Uh, you know, humans since the dawn of time have been experiencing things and passing them on. And what do they do? They experience something and then they write it down and then somebody else reads it and they pass it along. In fact, um, I watched a documentary, uh, I wish I could remember the name, where somebody suggested, an anthropologist who suggested that the thing that makes humans different from all other species on Earth is that they have successfully managed to pass learning on to the next generation. And there are other, they show, they show cases where you know, particularly chimps and apes can teach each other. And you can, all, a lot of the mammals, a lot of the other kingdom, they teach each other, uh, you know, kind of verbally and, and, and experientially, uh, but they never transfer that knowledge to the next generation if somebody dies. So if the links of the chain break, uh, those species don't have a way to pass that learning on unless it's just been, you know, burned into their genetics. It doesn't pass on, and that and that humans very uniquely uh, have the ability to pass on their learning in the form of written communication and, and other things like that. And ch- it could work. You could train chips how to work. It probably could. I mean, they're pretty dang close. You never know. Uh, and and humans do reason. Uh, animals don't, as far as we know. I I don't think that's completely true uh i have a dog i guarantee you she knows how to reason and she's very logical and her brain is remarkable um so (laughs) so but she can't write you know she cannot transfer her knowledge on so um a couple things here one of them is you know let's celebrate the fact that we have the ability to write uh somebody i've been private mentoring for more than six years yesterday i said well why don't you just go check your notes and he goes i can't i haven't been keeping my notes i'm like what do you mean you haven't been keeping your notes and i i got on him i'm like he stopped he's he's one of these learners who's all over the board 
right? He's constantly learning something new. He's learned amazing things. And what does he have to show for it? Knowledge. How are you going to prove that knowledge to somebody else? You're going to make a project. What if you, what if your obsession is different, uh, algebraic equations or geometry functions, things like that. How are you going to convey that you've taught yourself and you've learned all that stuff? Well, writing is a big way to do that. And if that is what you're learning, show them your notebook. In fact, take what's in your notebook and take some of your stuff out of your notebook and make it into something that's public. Keep a repository of your examples. All of those wild thoughts that you have. I mean, look at, look at Da Vinci for God's sake. Look at what he did. His notebooks are filled. Was he making those notebooks for anybody else? No. Talk about an autodidact. I mean, think like Da Vinci. Be Da Vinci. You know, he was constantly thinking about so many new different things. He's probably really overwhelmed with, with all of, uh, don't you, your brain from memory. Yeah. He was overwhelmed with so many things that came to his mind all the time that he had to figure out how to capture this. I've got an idea for how a human can fly. Draw, 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 draw. You know, so part of part of being an autodidact is is writing. It's writing. It's drawing. It's it's capturing your ideas in a way that you can recall later, and that potentially other people can recall. And but uh, if Da Vinci Cam set up, uh, do I have Da Vinci Cam? Is that what this is called? <laughs> uh, I don't even know what that is. Let's see. <laughs> they can't see my brain muscles. <laughs> they could actually. Writing is important, but it's not the end all. I agree. I agree. Uh, and and but I'm, I'm, we're just talking about the writing point right now. Um, I think uh, executing, exercising, experiencing—that's uh, where all the critical thinking comes in. Uh, reading and researching. So it's it's a process. There's a bunch of stuff there. Um, he oh, Da Vinci wrote using mirrors. I did not know that. Uh, did Da Vinci use Emacs? He probably would have. Tell you the truth. I'll bet you anything Da Vinci would have used Emacs if he were alive today. I, I, I would I would bet good money on it. Because he was in one place and only cared about efficiency and, and doing what he wanted to do. He wasn't he wasn't thinking about commo- connecting remotely to multiple systems all over the world. And if he were alive, w- would he be interested in connecting to those systems? I have a feeling Da Vinci would not have been a hacker. He would have been one of these guys who was just, you know, in his own brain, capturing his own thoughts and writing them. He'd be one of these guys who has a really like butt ugly web page that has a bunch of stuff on it, except for these really amazing <laughs> drawings, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't, maybe he probably would have redone it all. To tell you the truth. <laughs> he probably would have made his own, you know, that's just how he is. Right. So anyway, I, I did really love studying about him a lot in my junior high school class. I got to really get into that. Um, he probably would have thought both were really well, depending on the case. Right. It's totally true. I mean, he's, he, I don't, he doesn't capture me the kind of close minded in terms of like technologies. I don't, he doesn't seem, he would have been very close minded. So, um, you know, we only have a half an hour left and I want to just review over all the things we covered, um, and kind of give an opportunity for people to ask questions again, uh, about, about stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. He did do mirror writing. That's right. I, I cannot do that. His brain was seriously amazing. Um, I did want to put another little shout out for, uh, R- hashtag RWXGG. If you are tweeting, uh, about anything related to what's going on on the boost uh, and you want to use a hashtag, um, do not go, you're going to do it anyway, but do not go to RWXGG's Twitter account. I have nothing to do with that Twitter account. Unfortunately it exists and I can't do anything about it. I reported it, uh, just you've been warned if you go there that is not the same thing but hashtag in fact i want to take it back i want to take it out of that ridiculous person's hands uh it really kind of triggers me that that kind of stuff exists um but if you uh if you click on rbxgg the the um uh good vibes from collaborate this is a different thing so there is a, there is a, and there's also um, a hashtag for autodidacts, by the way. Uh, so here we go. Autodidacts is a back, is a topic you can go to. I, I did need to mention that with the Twitter uh, because I wanted to be sure that everybody knows that that's not related to anything that I'm doing. 
and um, that there is a Twitter account for uh, uh, that, and I mean, there's a hashtag RWXGG is a hashtag. All right, I'm I'm sorry, guys, but I just yeah, uh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. If you want to, please, everybody, report it. Can please everybody report it? Can you please report it? Because I want it. I don't want it out there, and I I really want to get rid of it. Okay, so <laughs> just okay. Um, it has nothing to do with me. I don't. It was. It existed before I existed. So he has squatters' rights. But um, anyway. So next, next topic. Uh, let's review what we did this week. So um, this week we went through uh, lots of things changed up here. So I'm going to go through the schedule um, and click on getting started. And we'll go to the top. So did I cover everything else? Learning to oh, dogma is death. Uh, so dogma is death. Uh, you know what dogma is, right? Dogma is getting so set in your ways that you refuse to listen to anybody else's opinion and to have your opinions challenged and you get defensive and angry about it. Uh, we all get defensive and angry when people contradict our worldview. It's just the nature of human beings. It's called the backfire effect. You can watch a thing about that on Adam Ruins Everything. Uh, but what's really dangerous is when we double down and dig our heels in and won't listen to anybody else under any circumstances, no matter what. And that is death. I mean, there is no, no progress can happen when you have decided that's it. There is no other way. And you might have strong enough beliefs because there's so much objective evidence like gravity uh, or the world is round that, that you, yeah, you're, it's going to take like a mountain of evidence to even suggest that you consider another opinion that the earth is flat. Uh, but even that, you know, the very, very scientific method itself uh, claims that nothing is for sure. We should test everything. Um, and so, but just be careful with this. Uh, and that goes for VI and Emacs. And I hope, um, I, at least I want to believe about myself that I have gotten more flexible, even in my own dogmatic uh, technology beliefs and um, that I can, can change, including one very recently. So uh, very recently I went off saying this is a dumb way to use VI. You should never use VI like Emacs. Uh, you should only use VI as a way of, of remotely connecting. And why on earth would you want to use visual mode when you can't use that on any remote system that has VI? Uh, by the way, that's an opinion shared by Last Miles, um, and uh, so I, I. But I've challenged my own belief on that, uh, and I believe, uh, yeah, you, you can use Emacs on a remote system uh, if you want to make it to do that that way. It's not the best way, but if you want to use VI as basically Emacs on your own computer, um, I don't know him, but I've watched him a couple times, and um, then then that is that is totally okay. Uh, so in that sense, it's it's not so much an opinion as much as it's a, a tool for the job. And if that's your choice, fine. Uh, but if you, right, if you actually attempt to use uh, those skills and environment where you're managing systems that don't have them, and I know that doesn't sound like there are scenarios that exist that, that have that, uh, but there are, there's a lot of them. And if you work for the enterprise, uh, there's a good chance you're going to be administering systems that have Solaris, which is what Last Miles runs, uh, or they have AWK or um, uh, AIX uh, or other systems like that. Um, if you want to live in a world where only Linux exists on everything, or if you want to live in a world where you imagine Emacs isn't pre-installed on everything, uh, or Arch is, is on everything, fine. Uh, but you know, when that's not true, uh, just know that that's what you're getting into and you might have to relearn a lot of things. So that's where I come from. But, but I will confess right now, uh, that, um, let's see, just got promoted to AIX VI only for me. Yeah, okay. So yeah, if you're using AIX, there's a good case of it. So the reason that I am, so I've changed from being sort of triggered and dogmatic and angry to saying, all right, fine. But just know what you're giving up. Just know what you're getting into when you do it. Is it bad? I don't know, bad and good. But but it's definitely bad if you're going to work in an AIX environment next week and you didn't know better, and all of a sudden you have to reload your fingers have to relearn everything they ever learned before. It's the same reason you would say uh, if you try to learn to type with two fingers, you can do that and survive. <laughs> you know, but it's not going to be as efficient as if you use all your fingers. That's just the objective truth. So, but you can, if that's what you want to do for your whole world, 
and life fine but but and that's not a dogmatic opinion that's more of a scientific opinion that's like you will be faster if you use your, all of your hands uh to type anyway so but be careful with your dogma uh check your dogma you know and because it is death and it, and it, not only that for you but for others uh so you can yeah, every single time i've lost my shit we'll say it's been because of something that I felt so dogmatic about because I knew that it was going to cause somebody else harm. And that is my trigger uh, that makes me get very dogmatic, including uh, very recently, the last couple of days, going off on the guy who wrote that horrible, horrible Vim blog. I mean, it, the writing in the blog is fine and great. It communicates his point very well. The problem is, is that the points are dead wrong. <laughs> They're bad. And I attacked his, the blog really heavily. And uh, I don't mind attacking ideas, uh, but the person felt attacked. And in this case, there's nothing I could do. People feel attacked when you attack their ideas. And that's too bad. We should also learn to not do that. We need to do a yoga stream. Yes, we do. Uh, make us all better. I definitely need it. Um, so I explain my script for the markup section on RBXGG. Um, if you'd like to, I can talk about that quickly. We have some time here. Uh, we are going to be doing that um, quite a bit uh, during the next phase. So, um, okay, so right here, uh, section five, knowledge with structure as source. Um, I've moved that uh, until after the Linux stuff. Because by then we're going to be able to understand what is in the scripts that I'm going to show you right now. So don't feel panicked. Just know uh, if you want to understand uh, what's in the script, we're going to talk about bash scripting for a full week. I gave it a whole week. I'm really happy about that. Uh, do I think bash is the best beginner language? No. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't want to wait. We've done so much with bash already uh, that if we wait until after JavaScript in week 11, you'll forget everything you just learned this week. So we're going to jump right into Linux. Uh, we're going and then we're going to jump right into Linux uh, command line and bash. And then that's like, you know, a really solid month of nothing but Linux. Um, and then we'll start to do the coding languages and stuff. And so by then, uh, everybody should feel really, uh, fulfilled for, for, in terms of like, you know, getting ready with your Linux and your terminal skills should be really in place by the time we, we hit them hard in week five and six. Um, Netlify is giving a 404 for trying GitLab pages. Um, for which one? Which one are you trying to do, Carlos? Uh, you're talking about this one? So I, there's plenty of broken li links on my thing, but uh, we've had one request for me to talk about the script. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll go through the script and... Um, just tell you what it's doing. I actually made uh, a fix to the script. If you want to see the script, you can um, go download it. It's actually on RWXGG. It's, it's inside of the um, it's inside of the source code. So sorry for the white, uh, but if you go to RWX.GG/build, uh, this is the build script that I'm going to be talking about for about ten minutes. Sounds like, and um, and we can go we can go through that. So Bash is actually, well, technically, yeah, Bash is going to be the first language we cover. Um, I didn't plan it that way. It just worked out that way. Um, unless you guys have another suggestion. And again, this is a community. Uh, I actually wanted to learn JavaScript as the first language. Um, however, uh, you know, I've, I've thought about like not learning all of Bash, like maybe just learning the basics. Uh, but what I'm starting to get is I'm because we've done all this stuff about customizing your Linux environment, people are already asking about scripts and they want to start making them. And I feel, I mean, I changed the structure of the schedule uh, to answer that question in demand for uh, how to do fun bash automation. And I got to tell you, there is nothing like automating something with bash. As soon as you do that, you do it a couple. So let me give you an example. Um, and everyone, regardless of what they were doing, is going to use Bash eventually. So even though I would never in a million years <laughs> recommend people learn Bash as their first language, uh, however, I'm recommending it here. And the, I think we found the one oddball case where Bash makes sense to be the first language to use. And what is that case? When we learn Linux first. We learned Linux first. We learned about our shell first. We learned about our terminal. We are using Bash every day to execute commands. It's what I think it may be one of the few cases out there uh, for learning 
a little bit more about bash before anything else because you're using it every day anyway on the terminal every time you execute a command. So you're already using it. You might as well understand it, uh, even though it's not, it's by far the probably one of the worst syntaxes for a beginner to learn. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm all just going to put it out there. I'm a little bit conflicted about how this is turning out to be that we're learning bash first. Um, and, and by the way, if, if uh, just copy and paste it, right? If you get to the point and you just have to copy and paste it because you don't understand it, uh, that's totally fine. Uh, regular, regular, ex, regular expression patterns are in the JavaScript book. Uh, suffice it to say that, that when we get to JavaScript, you're going to, you know, sigh a little bit of relief here because you're like, wow, this syntax is so much easier to understand. Um, and, and, and that's fine. It's not horrible. Uh, I began, but yeah, so, so anyway, uh, I, I, I cannot imagine ever learning bash first for any other scenario. I would never teach it first. I never have in like seven years. I've never taught bash to anyone. Uh, and I'm kind of ashamed of that because I mean, I've used it a lot and people end up picking up on their own, but I've never actually taught it. And yet it's, it's, it's hands down my favorite language, uh, even more than Go. I love Go, but I get so much done with Bash. For example, let me give you a demonstration. Um, can we push JavaScript up a bit? Um, I thought about pushing JavaScript up in front of HTML and CSS. Um, the problem with that is, I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, Let's talk about this is supposed to be for review. So this is a more important topic than showing you my script. Uh, I can show you my script another time. Let's let's talk about the schedule for a second since I got you here. Um, so pattern expansion. Oh, I know. I don't know if I'm going to cover it. I there's a part of me that wants to bump eloquent JavaScript up and bump back web design and CSS. And the reason for that is um, net web does naturally feed into JavaScript, but how much web? I mean, this is this is this is 300 pages of web and HTML and CSS. Uh, and here's the problem: uh, you can't complete the JavaScript stuff uh, without knowing HTML and CSS, because the JavaScript stuff is manipulating stuff in the DOM, the document object model, which is in the HTML stuff and the CSS stuff. So JS is used for everything from web to games. So yeah, so it depends. Uh, I, and can I, since we're kind of off the rails here with, with learning bash first, this is what I would really, I really feel like kind of needs to be done in my gut. I want to do jo eloquent JavaScript right after bash. And here's my logic on this. And this is, I would never have come to this conclusion had we not gotten to it organically like this. This is what's so great about organic learning is that you can like figure out what plays into the next thing and you can, you, you, who cares what's supposed to be next. You can figure out what logically comes next. So this is what I'm saying. So if we come out of bash, yeah, uh, yeah. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is something that's a little crazy. Okay. Um, is that we, we just fresh come out of bash scripting. That means we learned what variables are. We learned what, you know, how to loop on and all of that jazz. And then while, while the learning about the structure of coding languages and logic is still fresh in your head, we immediately replace it with JavaScript knowledge of the same thing immediately. In other words, we don't let it get cold because what's going to happen is you, do you see what I'm saying? Um, because you're going to learn how to script in bash. You're going to learn what a variable is. You're going to learn what a function is. You're going to learn how to loop. And then you're going to be gone for a month before we do any coding again. I mean, any logical coding again. And so I know it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But I think, but rather than have bash be burned into your brain as your first language, I, I feel like we need to immediately replace the, or add or supplement that bash learning with JavaScript in terms of logic, in terms of like where things go and stuff like that. And then, and then, then hear me out here. 
And then after you learn the JavaScript, you're going to get to the sections in JavaScript where it's going to start talking about HTML and the DOM. And you'll be like, wait, what's the DOM? And now you see, now you're, now you're naturally motivated to learn about HTML. And I know that seems like it's totally on its head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know that seems like it's totally upside down after Linux because it builds on command line powers. I agree. So this is what I'm going to suggest. And so we build our command line powers with bash and then we use node command line powers with JavaScript. So then we show that JavaScript, at least in sense of our programming, is just another terminal language. In fact, that's what Prim Prim Primagian is doing. Primagian is using, he's using TypeScript on the command line. Now, I'm not suggesting it's Node is a good place to, to do it that way, but we will, we, we are going to totally take this upside down and we're going to learn JavaScript on the command line first. Think about that. We're going to learn JavaScript on the command line first. Whoever does that, that's absolutely insane. Well, it just makes sense because we already learned. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, I would never have gone into it this way, but, but the reasons, let me justify the reasons one more time. The reasons are we're kind of getting sucked into learning bash because it's so cool. And we all know, we already know the command line. Okay. Secondly, uh, we, we want to immediately supplement our learning from bash with a, another real language we'll say, and, and we'll use JavaScript for that. We'll stay on the command line. We'll learn node on the command line. And then. When we get to the chapters in Eloquent JavaScript book that start talking about web stuff, we'll do it and we'll move JavaScript into the web and then we'll do enough HTML to get through those activities. And then after all of that's done, we'll do the HTML and we'll say, okay, now let's actually learn how to make web pages. We know how to script them. Now let's actually make the stuff that we're scripting. Uh, normally I teach JavaScript first. Which is why, and by the way, let me also say that normally I also start with web browsers and VS Code first. So this is the first time in two years, uh, yeah, this is the first time in two years that I have gone back to teaching the terminal to beginners first. And, and I strongly believe, uh, and that's, that's, honestly, that's what's sucking us into the bass stuff. Now, uh, to be completely fair, it's for those of you who like Python out there, Python is a better command line language to learn after bash. Uh, and there's there's a really big part of me that thinks that we should learn Python after Bash. Uh, but if we do that, we don't have enough time and it doesn't fit into our progression. You see what I'm saying? If we learn JavaScript from the command line, that leads into the progression, which is then, oh, well, I need to now, you know, and it, we'll, we'll put knowledge is structure after that as well. Uh, why? Because knowledge is structured source is a big replacement for HTML. Uh, so we're going to, and you know, but that's also going to show you how you can like make HTML and kind of thing. So I, I'm going to go ahead and make that change. Uh, it, actually, eventually you will need to install Node.js. Yes. Um, and you won't need the latest one. You just need Node.js. I actually have an install script for that. Um, so, but again, that's, we, we're talking about a month away, right? So if you want the, um, if you want the config to install Node.js, um, JS and C Python isn't that hard anymore. Yeah, after yeah, I I write. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and you know what that's going to do? I, I like this too. That's going to give us a buffer between because <laughs> after we learn JavaScript, we're going to need a break, guys. We're going to need a break before we hit C. I, I I like the way this is shaping up because then our break, so to speak, will be HTML and CSS. All right. So those two week, that two week break where we learn HTML and all CSS, and don't get me wrong, CSS is 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 not you know kindergarten, uh, but it definitely is easier than C. If we go if we go bash JavaScript C, everybody's brains is going to melt. <laughs> so we, somebody got, somebody tweeted yesterday that it's like after a full day I have a, I have a headache. Is that a good idea? Is that a good sign? boxes and boxes and boxes right so so let's do this let's and and again this is this is organic but let me just show you the um the installer for uh if you go into my config i have under common i have the installers which i probably need to pull out but here is the installer for uh somebody was asking uh for node uh that's really the only way you should install it if you want to get the latest and you want to have it um properly memory checked um uh 
another thing I like about this too is that this is going to make you uh, uh, make other streams immediately interesting to you. So Primagian, this is another inf this is another thing influencing this decision. Um, so Primagian is is doing a lot of great code in um, what is he doing? He's coding. He's writing a lot of code in in TypeScript in JavaScript. And so you will get more out of those other streams if we learn JavaScript more quickly. Because then when you're watching them, if assuming you have time, a course idea, I mean, for the course part, regular expressions by O'Reilly. Yeah. Yeah. It's an age old book. It's really good. It's way, way overkill. Um, but it's definitely a good book. Yep. We'll talk about that. I, yep. I bought that book in like 97, I think. Um, uh, the the um the regular expressions that we're going to cover uh we're going to cover them both as a part of bash and as a part of javascript which is another reason we need to do javascript right away because the knowledge about regular expressions we don't want to spread that all, all over the, the the boost uh okay yeah if i were learning bash is my first language yeah and and um again we're not um i'm just going to warn you right now i'm not going to go into the weeds on the bash stuff uh, and also, I read through William Schott's uh, multiple chapters in part four. That's where it is. Uh, and he does a fantastic job of soft pedaling some of the hardest things you'll ever learn um, and making them very digestible. I'm so happy to have found that resource because I don't have to do it. Because <laughs> he does a really good job of writing it. All right. Um, if anybody wants to, uh, speaking of headaches, uh, in our shiny new Linux. Yes. And you can automate all the things. Uh, the really great thing about knowing JavaScript from the command line too, is that you can integrate JavaScript into your automations, um, uh, and, and, and use it that way. And so, so that's, that's definitely a way to, to do that. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and keep knowledge with structure as source. Um, uh, right after that, that's covering, just so you know, that's covering YML, uh, JSON and Markdown. I wonder if, what if we kept that, what if we kept that in between JavaScript so that I can show you guys how to use Pandoc and how to use, that will go well with the scripting that we did in Bash. I think that's, I think that might be the thing to do. That would give you a one week break between, um, between Bash and and what Linux, whichever one you want, so whatever Linux you want, uh, I recommend, we'll make some recommendations and Pop! OS is what I recommend for beginners, uh, but it depends on you. If you, if you really want to dive into Linux, um, and you feel like you have the chops for it, you can try to do Arch. Um, but, um, I'm not going to recommend that to everybody. It's really up to you. Uh, there are some that I recommend are better for beginners though, particularly Debian. Everything you see me do on the stream is based on a Debian distro. And if you use Arch, you're going to have to learn all that stuff on your own. That's different from, from package installation and stuff like that. Is XML not a thing? XML is still very much a thing. It's just not a thing, um, that I feel like, you know what? You make a good point. Maybe we should add XML to the knowledge source as well, because that leads naturally into HTML because H strictly speaking, XML is dying a slow death, but it's still very alive in the, um, like Microsoft Word docs or XML, uh, XML will never die. Uh, screw it and just start with HTML. Which one are you, what are you, what are you talking about? You're talking about missing XML. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we need to put XML in. Um, I think it's probably so I think we should probably mention, uh, XML, uh, in the structured data because you will encounter it. The other place we're going to talk about it is in images. SVG images are XML documents and they are not going anywhere. They are a very, very powerful modern use of the internet and they are hundred percent XML. So in that sense, knowing XML is, is yeah. It's going to be a natural follow on to that. And I love that you learn HTML first and then images. And so we'll probably learn uh, XML as a part of learning SVG images. And one of the dithered gifts, a brief overview, maybe. Um, yes, we're going to, we'll talk about XML for one full segment, 40 minutes. 
uh, while we talk about images when we talk about SVG. Uh, it's super important that you learn how to animate SVG. For example, if you ever want to do anything like this, this, this is all XML. This is an animated SVG uh, image. And this is using JavaScript and XML in order to do all of the rescaling and everything. So if you, you'll see them all over the internet, you'll see animated SVGs all over the place. And that is a very, very modern use of the World Wide Web. And you cannot do that without knowing XML. So, but it's XML with a very specific purpose. It's XML as it is used for SG, S, SVG images are not, they're just, they're just XML. That's all they are. So, and in this case, it's some, if you want to do this, you have to write your image in XML in your web page. It has to be embedded in your web page. You can't have it, you know, sourced if you know how to do HTML development. It's not, it's not sourced. It actually has to be embedded in your in your page, which means there still is a compelling reason to learn XML. Um, uh, with JavaScript Canvas, no, no way. Why would I do that? You can do that with JavaScript Canvas, and we will, by the way. So the Eloquent JavaScript has the JavaScript Canvas game in it, which is pretty cool. It doesn't use a framework. Uh, I'm really tempted to teach you guys Phaser, the Phaser game engine, at the same time that we cover that chapter. So I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, any of you that want to learn how to make a really easy platformer game in like 20 minutes uh, using the Phaser engine, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'll put a teaser out there. I am going to have make a game with JavaScript and Phaser uh, around the same time that we're doing the project for JavaScript Canvas in Eloquent JavaScript. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go open the book, Eloquent JavaScript. It's free. Um, and you can read, read through that and find out what, what's going on with that. Uh, I wonder, hmm. Uh, once upon a time, there were a bunch of Easter eggs in this site, and there's not as many now. I may, I, I have lots of other things to document first, and then I'll go back to building Easter eggs into my site. RWXGG will contain, mark my words, RWGG will, RWXGG will contain multiple Easter eggs at some point. In fact, all of the content will be covered in some fashion through an Easter egg plot line that goes through all the content. It is, it's something I've been working on for a long time. Uh, I started here. Uh, the problem with this is the first clue is is now gone. <laughs> the first clue on this site is now gone. It used to be on our van. So, yeah, we're going to have to cover the DOM in that week. Yes, we are. And, and unresigned, uh, when we talk about the DOM, that will naturally lead into HTML and all of that other stuff, which ironically is going to come after JavaScript. And this... This is, this is something of an experiment that I'm kind of excited about. This is the first time I've taught anybody JavaScript without teaching them HTML first, ever. Um, but I'm really curious to see how that goes. Because these days, JavaScript, yes, it's it was born in the web, but it's much more than that. So, and TypeScript certainly is more than that. Watch Primeagee and he'll show you. Uh, type, you know, JavaScript ain't, ain't just for web pages anymore. Uh, but did you did you know... Did you know that most of Netflix runs on TypeScript? Most of Netflix. I'm not kidding. Most of all the Netflix infrastructure is running on TypeScript. When, when he was talking about that from first person, <laughs> when he was talking about that, oh, you guys looking for my Easter eggs now, aren't you? Oh, God. The reason I can't put the Easter eggs the way I used to put them in is because is because it used to be that the source code for skillsec.io was private. You know how hard it is to make an Easter egg site where you can get all the source code for free? <laughs> Just go download it. So let's see, both are used, I believe. Oh, Kotlin, yeah. And um yeah. Um so I, I'm going to, I'll tell you something else I'm going to do that I haven't done yet. I'm almost, I'm almost completely decided to do this. We're out of time, but I'm almost completely decided that I'm going to lock down the site. But if I do that, then people can't submit bug reports. And that's, that's a really conflicted on that <laughs> because if I do that, then all the Easter eggs would be much more fun. But I could make the Easter eggs a lot harder. Oh, I started Skillstack years ago. 
like 2013. This is my old, this is my old business. I still, this is my, this is how I make my money today. Uh, let's see. I see you work through your presentation. Do you think uh, to do some applicable or practice course over a Raspberry? Uh, well, that's funny you say that because up until today, uh, the schedule had a full week of networking on it. And the project for that was going to be running a Minecraft server on Raspberry. Um, so I am going to talk about Raspberry on the, in, in the Linux week. So Raspberry is one of the, uh, one of the main, um, Linux, Linux C's, I guess, uh, that we're going to call. You can actually see all of the Linux, uh, that we're going to talk about. What is Linux overview of the distros? Uh, what about Manjaro? Oh, this is old. I must not have upgraded this yet. This is the old one. I've rewritten this whole thing. Oh, Linux distros. Yeah. I, this is stuff that all has to be written. I haven't. Oh boy. There you go. Is it just distros, Rob? What did you write? I don't, maybe I didn't save it. No, there it is. Distros. Um, Easter eggs in a private sub module. Yeah. The Easter eggs will probably be like w something I started out doing. They'll be encrypted. Yeah. I'm just going to encrypt the Easter eggs and, and put them in and you'll have to, you'll have to, to find the flags to decrypt the Easter eggs. Uh, right. Yes. Let's do. Um, <laughs> What are the Easter cojones? Um, so anyway, this has been fun, guys. Uh, hopefully, we know where we're going next. I'm glad we had this talk because this is really saving what I'm going to do over the weekend. Uh, over the weekend, I have to get next week completely ready. Uh, so please uh, have a fun weekend. Uh, we are going to do a raid here pretty soon. Um, and just know that the schedule will be updated. And... Um, that these dates have the videos you can come watch them anytime uh get those brains churning yes um and uh if you if you i may actually make a video about the the script uh so those of you who didn't see the script the build script i plan on making a video about it because i just made it uh asynchronous which turned the time you guys remember how can i show you just something really well no i'll do it on the video i don't want to waste your time uh tracking time is isolation is hard yes it is uh do, 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 do. and make sure i didn't miss anything always be learning uh don't ever be done learning um avoid words like i'm an expert um you know stick with words like i'm a beginner it's called beginner's mind um you know you should always be learning in some sense don't be an imposter don't feel like you're an imposter but and then also don't feel like you know everything too right so live in that middle space IBM developer is pretty nice. We, we raided him before. I actually, I want to raid uh, the other suggestion if that's okay. Um, so who was that? Let me go see if I can find that. I think Zeros, you mentioned him. Yeah, lots of stuff that you guys can dig into. Let me do Chris Titus Tech. Um, my God, it's been a fun week though. Been, I'm so exhausted. But it's been worth it. You know how when you get really tired and you like, but it's like a good tired. <laughs> That's what I feel like. So this has been a remarkable adventure for me. I look forward to, to doing this all through the summer with you. And we'll see you. Uh, I will be doing a lot of fun stuff for the heck of it this weekend too online over time. So just stop by and say hi. Uh, some of it I will be doing off stream. Uh, please don't give me crap for not having my video on. Uh, I banned somebody for it and then I unbanned them. Uh, if I don't have my video, just deal with it. It means that I'm focused. Okay. <laughs> Take care. I'm going to set the rate up. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I will be making a video, uh, this weekend, if not immediately about, um, uh, yeah, teaching and curriculum design. Uh, those separately hang in there. Uh, yeah, well, I, I've never done it separately. <laughs> I've do we just get raided? We just got raided as soon as we went to go raid somebody else. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. The Cyber Mentor raids us right as we're about to raid somebody else. This is going to be fun. So so they're going to get a nice raid from us who just raided. <laughs> that should be really fun. I'm glad everybody's together. You guys are fantastic. I need to raid Cyber Mentor. I haven't raided him yet. So 
or yeah so i need to i definitely need to raid cyber mentor uh oh did we okay great i was afraid um so if the seconds are ticking away i'm gonna take off see you this weekend sometime randomly i'm gonna do my twitch stop all right bye bye